Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, before we start, uh, we have the public comment section uh, of the evening. So if there's anybody here tonight that has anything to say that uh, is outside of, of what's before us for the two hearings or three hearings, uh, could you raise your hand and come to the podium? Yep. If you could just come to the podium and, and uh, give us your name and address. This is for the hearing. This is for the hearing. This is for the hearing. No, she's doing it. I think she's doing it. I'll stop. My name is Mary Finn. I co-own 274 Pleasant Street. Other than Jason uh, Road. Okay. This is in regards to the hearing then that we're about to jump into? Yeah, no, I, this was, before we get into that, this is the public comment section of the, of the evening where everybody gets a chance to talk about Anything. something that has nothing to do with what we're about to talk about. So, I didn't hear that part. Yeah, yeah, so you'll, you'll get a chance, um, and I'll call on you then. Is, is anybody here that has anything to say uh, about anything else other than what we're going to talk about tonight? If not, we'll open up the hearing. Okay. So, it is 7.05, and so we're going to... Um, where are we? Is this that? Continuation. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow. So we are going to open a continuation of a hearing on central business architectural permit and a site plan review for demolition of existing buildings and construction of a new four-story 69,785 square foot mixed residential commercial building at 256 Pleasant Street, Northampton map ID 32C-171 as published on December 24th and December 31st. A um, couple <coughs> ground rules first. This is technically, uh, this is a continuation of a meeting um, that we had a, a few weeks ago. So we're two and a half hours knee deep into a, into a meeting. So we're technically in the public comment section of that meeting. <coughs> but since that time, uh, there has been a subsequent meeting outside of this uh, venue. And there have been comments received and changes made. And so we're going to give the applicant a chance to show us what's, what's happened since then. Then the two boards will get an opportunity to uh, like a Q&A session with between the two boards and the applicant. And then we'll go back to the public uh, and receive comments. Since this is a continuation and not a new hearing, if you were here last time and you had something to say, uh, again, this is that same meeting. So we don't need to hear it again. Um, we've got those comments and we're just moving forward from that. If you have something new to say or you didn't get a chance to speak last time, obviously, um, we'd like to hear what you say tonight. So with that said, uh, if we can turn it over to the applicant and if you could walk us through on uh, what's happened in the last few weeks. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm Cliff Bomer from Davis Square Architects. And uh, it seems like only a few days ago that we were here, but we've uh, we received a lot of very constructive criticism the last time we were here, and we took it uh, to heart very seriously, and we've been very busy uh, working on things that we think make a, a building that uh, we think will make people very happy. We certainly hope that it does, because we've changed a lot of things. What I'm hoping to do is to run through the slides, and included in the slides, you'll see a small image of where we were and then where we are today. I think that might be the easiest way. I may miss some of the comments. I think all of you remember there, uh, we talked for a long time about the uh, guidelines. And I think you're seeing a different interpretation of the guidelines this time through. And, uh, but please, if I do forget some of the things, let me know. But we, uh, we had at least four people taking very detailed notes so that we could come back tonight uh, with a, a fresh approach to the development. The, the big, I mean, we've changed nothing as far as unit count, unit mix. That hasn't changed at all. I think uh, quite importantly, and you'll see it in a slide that comes up soon, we've uh, increased the commercial space on, on, uh, on Pleasant Street significantly, uh, largely in response. I think that came less from you guys than from uh, the neighborhood and some of the other business owners who really thought that their 
who expressed a, a tremendous amount of confidence in that corridor, in the Pleasant Street corridor, and encouraged us to, to include more commercial space, to even create more activity on the street. And we were very receptive to that and followed through on it. <clears throat> so we can start again. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to miss some things because we really did change a lot of things. Uh, but why don't we take a run here? Now, I'm, I guess I shouldn't get too far away from this. but. So this is, this is a little bit of a repeat, but I think it's kind of important because it does talk about the context uh, in the numerous presentations that we have done. And given that this is the first significant building that's uh, fulfilling the Central Business District guidelines, uh, it's, it stands uh, on, uh, alone a little bit, so you have to look a little harder for the context. But there is context there. There are buildings to take cues from. And I think it's important to look at the nearby buildings and the scale of the buildings, the materials, some of the moves, the architectural moves on the buildings. And I think you all know what all these buildings are. That's right across the street from us on Holyoke. That's at 24 feet. There's a little further up a curved facade on uh, Pleasant Street. This is a build, a dead, dead on shot. One of the comments that was made last time around was alignment of some of the architectural elements, and we are uh, doing that. We did raise up our storefront section higher than it was before to make sure we did have that alignment. But you can see the scale of some of the other buildings. This, uh, this is looking across the street where the buildings are up to 40 feet tall. Uh, further north on the east side of the street, 44 to 48 feet tall. And of course, a lot of masonry buildings with a variety of kinds of openings. Uh, but um, this, I think, if you're looking for the nearby context, this is really the nearby context. Uh, next slide. Just very, uh, this is, I know all of you people know that, but maybe if there's some new people in the audience, these are the Central Business District uh, zoning summary. Setbacks uh, very minimal, which is the idea of enlivening the street, activating sidewalks. Minimum height of the building, 30 feet. Maximum is 70 feet. Uh, we're way, way lower than that. The height of a, the, our roof height is 42 feet, a little bit under 42 feet uh, to the, our roof. Uh, commercial use, which is required to be at least 20 feet deep, which would not create uh, anywhere near the amount of commercial space that we have created on both our Holyoke space and our uh, Pleasant Street space, no parking requirement. Uh, Imad Zrain, our civil engineer, will talk more about parking, but uh, we're uh, well beyond no minimum parking. And here we are tonight with Central Business uh, Architectural. Uh, Walt is here. I wanted to have him talk. Walt is our landscape architect, and he'll talk a little bit about this, and then I'll get back into the building. Um, I'll be very brief and leave the uh, majority to questions, should there be any. Uh, the site plan is made up of maybe three com key or component parts. An L-shaped uh, parking lot with aggregated green around it, and that's on the north and the east portion of the property. Um, a courtyard, internal courtyard on the southwest corner that we'll discuss a little bit more in a, in a second. And then on the northwest corner, in the irregular shapes is a gathering play space largely for youngsters and t t tenants of the building and others to gather. It's got aggregated green, larger trees, and a play space as part of it in a transparent relationship to Short Street. Uh, in the l discussion last week and some of the testimony, there was a discussion about the access to the residential space and whether it would be inviting. And Hampton Court, among others, was mentioned. I'll point out that, as I did last week, that this courtyard is on the southeast and it gets sun from midday and e even early in the day on through later in the afternoon for most of the season. And on, as opposed to uh, the northeast, es essentially, at that Hampton's courtyard or the Chamber of Commerce e enjoys, the photographs you'll find on the website and here if you need to see them show it in shadow all the time. And the things that are different there, for instance, as one of the examples, is that it's got parking. 
trash re receptacles, a fence, and sometimes in, in its history had signs saying keep out. So it really looks like not an entrance or an invitation. So if we go to this space, which was discussed at some length last time, between the two buildings. It is currently 15 feet wide. I think a portion of it was a little narrower last time, something like 12 or 13 feet. It's been widened a couple of feet. But the difference here is, again, not only the southwest orientation, but the fact where the, if I can hold this steady enough, that whole access is commercial space with lighting and access, so that there is really a viable space day and night going into the uh, entry court and the main entrance for the uh, residential is at that location uh, in the early part of the courtyard with that exposed landing. So we are assured both climatically, orientation to the compass, and its nature, its appointments, and what is in fact being proposed there, that it's really going to be an invitation, a delightful way to arrive. One, it is secure because of, for a lot large part of the time, it'll be under the eyes of people in the shops, et cetera, and adjacent to it. The play space, all of these things are uh, placeholders. We would want to get as much aggregated green as we can, and as you can see on the plan, something like 12 or 13 sizable trees provide shade and help scale the space and provide green the year around. plan is pretty simple. It's largely uh, a small site and an urban situation, but making use of the green to the extent that is possible. With that, I'll leave it to questions that might follow in the discussion. So I'll quickly run through some of these plans and show you the changes. Again, what Walt was talking about, the exterior corridor that goes back into the courtyard, that is wider now than it was before. And I think one of the bigger changes that, uh, again, I was mentioning that we uh, greatly increased the size of the commercial space on Pleasant Street. We were already back pretty far anyway, but being f even further back now affords us the opportunity to create entry into the commercial spaces. We don't have a tenant right now, so you're not looking at a plan for a commercial space. That is a space that's reserved for commercial use, and uh, when we have our tenant, then we'll have to do some detailed design for that space, determining exactly where people will want to enter. So uh, I think that's an important point to make, including even at the front entry, where will the vestib vestibules be, where's the setback. We really need some tenants before we can define that in great detail. But the big move really was moving, moving that space back. Uh, we resized the, the main entry for residents, so the, any residents that are arriving on foot uh, can enter right through here and go into the main residential wing this way. And I think probably most of you remember that this wing back here, which is largely residents in this area, is raised up to ensure privacy uh, of the, some of the residential windows that open out towards the courtyard. We created a kind of semi or uh, sort of residential only zone in there, even though anybody could walk back there, the, really the main path uh, pedestrians might take if they want to cut across to Holyoke Street is diagonally across our uh, garden space and out to Holyoke space. The, uh, the uh, CDC is planning on relocating their offices into this, into this space. That size hasn't changed, but you, I, I'm sure you've noticed from the renderings we have changed the way that space looks now from the exterior is pretty different. This is a multi-purpose community room uh, that it can be used by the public and, and uh, the residents of the building and, of course, for meetings of Valley CDC. Otherwise, the, there have been some changes, and, uh, and I'll point them out in plan now because it will make it a little easier to understand when you look at the uh, perspective views and the elevations. One of the comments that I, I really appreciated a lot was that the change of material, you'll see we eliminated uh, metal panels entirely now, so that it makes the trans transitions simpler, actually. But I, there was a comment about the north elevation, that there was a flush condition where the material change happened, and we've fixed that all around where material changes happen. There's also a dimensional change in the facade, so it, it really helps the reading uh, quite a bit, I think. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on these plans that have changed. There really hasn't been that much that has changed. We've continued uh, a front facade that follows the curve, uh, in, in essence, the effective curve of our front 
uh, frontage, which actually is there, that diagonal line. We did change the sign band, and you'll, you'll notice that from the other views. It's much more uh, uh, visible in the other views. Uh, there, one other thing I'll just point out in plan before we jump over is this is a recessed entry. So as I was saying, this is our primary residential entry, so it's a protected entry into the uh, residential wing. <clears throat> uh, this is a typical floor plan uh, showing all the units. Uh, I actually would have to get closer to read the unit mix, but as I said, we didn't change the unit mix at all. The unit mix stays the same, number of ones, twos, and three bedrooms, and total unit count of 55. Okay, now, so this, up in the upper right-hand corner, the little cute pictures are where we were before and uh, this is where we are now for the comparable views so this is a, our uh, main elevation along Pleasant Street and you can see it's so this is the part that's really the frontage on Pleasant Street and then this is the end elevation so to speak of the commercial space that's on Holyoke Street so I think the the biggest changes are uh, in direct response to some of the comments we got, we greatly reduced the height of the parapet and replaced it with detailed brick, a lot more corbelled brick, uh, much more detail in the brick. We have a brick detail in, uh, in the cornice as well. We eliminated the large metal cornice. Uh, the, and as I was saying, the, with the change in the height of the parapet, we eliminated the openings. We had windows in the parapet, so to speak. Those are gone now. Uh, probably the, I think one of the more universally made comments was that people weren't very excited about the change of material on the main elevation. There was a lot of sentiment for uh, creating an all brick main elevation, which we were responsive to and did change. Uh, some of the comments were that it appeared to be almost two buildings because of the change in materials. And uh, in addition to uh, creating a more unified look through creating all brick all the way across, we decreased the setback in this right-hand piece as well. That was set a little further back before we moved it up now. So it, it is a more unified uh, facade that's presented to, uh, to Pleasant Street. Similarly, and that, that was the metal part. So the metal is now gone. We don't have the large metal panels anymore. I think the main comments we heard was that the, the reference to metal was more with respect to soffiting, metal soffiting on overhangs, things like that not necessarily metal panels, and we were uh, responsive to that and eliminated the metal panels. Uh, the changes on the, what I'll call the Holyoke commercial end, uh, is very similar uh, and more visible in the perspective views actually is changing, uh, also making that entirely brick as opposed to uh, brick plus metal panels. So the, those are the big changes. This is a view on Holyoke Street. So, oh, and this is, I think this is, uh, gives you an idea of what the exterior, how that exterior corridor works. That's the main residential entry. So you come off of Pleasant Street, walk by commercial space that spans this whole distance, is all our commercial space now. And then you reach the main entry into the residential lobby. Uh, there were, oh, another comment, and I know I'm going to miss some of these, so, but uh, there was a comment about the base being missing along here. We did redesign that, so we do have a base that comes up in the storefront system. Uh, I, I do also want to point out that the, we have not done the space plan for the CDC for, uh, for Valley yet. So I, I, what, you, what you saw in those plans is really just the space that's reserved. For Valley CDC. We haven't done the space plan yet. Uh, again, I think it's, it's probably the most illustrative to compare where we were and where we are now. This is, when I was talking about that flush material change condition, that's in this area here. Now we change that, the brick wraps further around and there's a, a break, a recess. There's actually a, a stairwell in there. A break before we switched to the cementitious siding material. Uh, there, we've added a couple bays that also speak to the residential 
piece of the building. I think another comment that we really took to heart was uh, on the rear, so-called rear elevation, I guess you'd call, it's really the east elevation that faces railroad tracks. Uh, there was a, a kind of an, an anomaly of a kind of bay there. We eliminated that and uh, continued a more steady rhythm of the residential scale bays. Uh, and again, I, so I think what's kind of happened is it's really simplified quite a lot. Uh, we've increased the amount of direct reference of using brick. We've uh, really uh, done a lot of detailing of the brick. We're imagining a, a lot of uh, more finer grain detailing of the brick, uh, more directly referential to the, some of the other historic models in Holyoke, and we uh, completely got rid of the metal panels. Um, we can go to the next one. <clears throat> Maybe. Oh, here we go. Okay. So, again, uh, I think it's important to look, oops, <clears throat> important to look at where we were and where we are today. Uh, we addressed a lot of the comments. There's the, uh, the larger parapet with the openings in it that we've gotten rid of and put smaller scale brick panels, uh, detailed brick panels. We did raise up the elevation of the first floor uh, retail or commercial area. We squared off this piece. I think there was some concern about the curved um, sign band that wrapped around. Here's that space I was talking about that is now that big. It used to be bigger. The metal panels are completely gone. Uh, we did uh, brick detailing. We did look around a lot of the cornices and frankly concluded that this was, given where it sits, in the, in the city, this is a more typical type of treatment of the cornice We're using the brick detailing, so we adopted that. This is a broader opening now. That's, uh, it used to uh, be a little pinched at the end and then opened up again. Uh, it's opened up completely now to 15 feet, so it's wider than it was the last time you saw it. Uh, the, I think the I want to talk a little bit. Walt started to talk about uh, the importance of it being very inviting to to go into this, and we're really believing that uh, the type of you know, developing commercial activity that goes virtually halfway down the building, and knowing that that is a primary residential entry for anybody who's coming and going, uh, going out at night, walking down, uh, you know, further towards Main Street, taking part of the other parts of the city. We, we're imagining a lot of traffic there, a lot of foot traffic, and we really want that. Uh, and I think indicated on the elevations, if you tune into that level of detail, we're uh, suggesting having some uh, sconces along there, you know, down lighting sconces, have nice, warm, inviting feeling, then, of course, uh, culminating in the entry to the uh, residential piece, the main residential lobby. Uh, we can look at the next one. So you can see there are big changes here as well. So we've adopted a fully uh, brick facade all the way around. Uh, that's that uh, base that I was talking about before. Uh, I want to be, again, careful. We haven't done the space plan for, uh, for, the, for the development yet. And the exact way that we're, we're going to enter the uh, community space is still a little bit up in the air. But fundamentally, I think you're looking at something that's uh, from the outside. This is what we expect you will see. Uh, I want to point out, because in some of our meetings, there's been some confusion about what we're actually looking at here. I just want to be sure to point out that everybody understands this is not parking related to our development. Our parking is on the other side. And there'll be another view where I can show that. But this is a parking that is uh, associated with the business on the corner. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. And I also, well, you can see for yourself. But we change that quite a lot. Oh, it's, no, that was my fault. I faked you out on that one. The, uh, uh, but anyway. I don't think you need. Do you want to go back to that one to, to look at the differences again? Or, no, okay. Let's stick here then. So um, here's that that uh, flush condition that we addressed. We now show where we have the ability to wrap the commercial right around the corner uh, because we actually do have uh, an easement across that space there. Uh, I think you can see better the connection across 
here. And I think there is, you know, there's clearly a more direct reference to the brick building immediately adjacent to our building and the awning, the notion of the awnings, and actually the buildings across the street also have a lot of awnings on them as well. Uh, I, I think that's the only big changes. I think that's really the big changes, wrapping the brick around full brick elevation, uh, going around to the whole width of the building, and then uh, dealing with that transition of materials right there. <clears throat> This computer is really slow. Uh, and this is a view from the, uh, coming from the south, headed north. There's that gap that, uh, or setback that was a little, uh, little larger before. It was a couple feet larger, actually, that space right there. And I think that some of the concerns that people had about it looking like multiple buildings, that uh, Amy's building, then the metal clad piece and the brick piece. So now it's a much more continuous uh, feeling across there with the, uh, sign band squared off and parallel to the street. And I think we have a new view, one that you haven't, oh no, it's not this one, but this, you saw this view before too. So this is kind of self-explanatory, but we did wrap the brick around. And I say, I think if you certainly imagine if, if this ever does get built out more, what you'll really see is that brick. And I think we've, we've provided enough brick that even if and I'm not saying that this ever should change or anybody would ever want to change it, but if it ever did change, uh, we have a lot of brick here, so whatever uh, setback might be established here, I think you'd really be looking at another brick elevation in the distance beyond any corner development. <clears throat> now, this is a view you didn't see before. So this is uh, coming from under the underpass. So th this is the, uh, our driveway here not over on the other side. This is our driver that goes back along the tracks. This is the extension of the commercial space along Holyoke Street. This is, so this is a, a, a tall one-story space, uh, which we can make that tall because uh, I think I've, you know that, that the site yeah. slopes uh, north to south. So we pick up some height down at this end. And uh, so we're able to get more commercial space here. And this is actually one entry that we really wanted to neck down because the view back into there is into our parking area. We put a little curve in the driveway to keep the focus on, on planted materials and you know, landscape finish materials. But uh, we thought it was a nice way to uh, help constrict that view back into the uh, service side of the building. <clears throat> and this is just a couple other views. In fact, it might only be one more view. But again, I think you can easily imagine, I think this is kind of an interesting shot that at least makes me think about the future of Pleasant Street and the kind of development that buildings like this and, and similarly scaled, although some, slightly smaller building actually, similarly scaled building could uh, help encourage between the two developments. And that's the end of my part. Uh, we now have the civil engineer, Imad Srain, who can talk about the uh, site. Do you want me to run that on? You better than I Good evening. For the record, uh, again, my name is Imad Zurain from Develop Zurain, uh, professional civil engineer. Uh, I'll run through you know, the site plan in a, in a kind of a quick review. Uh, not a whole lot of change on the site, and I'll, I'll point out the changes that we had made since the last time. Um, this just shows you the existing conditions. So basically, as Cliff mentioned, our access to, to the site is through Holyoke. We are still proposing 31 parking spaces that start in this location and wrap around the building with handicapped parking in this location here, uh, with the ability to be able uh, to turn around in this dead-end parking 
you know, we have an eight foot <coughs> aisle for the, for the handicap parking that people can pull in back into this space and be able to leave the site. Uh, the main change that happened since uh, the submission last time is we had removed some proposed pavement that we had shown uh, uh, within an existing uh, access easement that, that the, uh, the applicant has from this property. Uh, you know, given uh, we've, we've heard, you know, comments from, from the abutter that they basically they need to remove the, the work uh, on this property, which since we've moved that, we still show the proposed work uh, within the sidewalk as the uh, city has requested along the entire frontage on uh, Pleasant Street, as well as Mount Holyoke. We're rebuilding the entire sidewalk from curb all the way back to the, uh, to the building. That's really the major change that, that happened as far as Utilities and drainage, uh, that remained the same. You know, we're still tying in our utilities in Pleasant Street. I know there's, there was a question uh, either from the board or from the neighbors, I'm not sure, but there was a question on the, on the rain garden uh, that's located in this location here. Uh, this will pick up runoff from this, uh, from this parking lot into a swale down to this rain garden. And there was some concern about the rain garden and water collecting there and whatnot. <laughs> I mean, rain garden, it is what's, what's the name called for. It's a garden uh, that collects rain during a during, uh, rain event. Uh, so in the majority of the time, it's going to look like a garden. It's going to have a lot of plants from the bottom all the way up along the side slopes, along the edges, that feeds off the rain that comes into it. But it has an outlet that will drain it dry uh, in the, ma the majority of the storm within 24 hours, the, the, the actual garden will be uh, basically dry. Uh, so the plants that will be used in that location will be plant uh, that will basically be able to uh, in, uh, take in inundation of water during uh, you know, certain period during the rainfall events. That's really the, the, so that's, you know, the rain garden. We had, as mentioned last time, we, we had received the DPW letter with some comments. Uh, we're, we were perfectly fine, you know, addressing all their, uh, meeting all their requirements as far as all the utility tie-ins and, and the drainage or what have you. You know, if there's any question, any further questions, they will be happy to, uh, to answer. Thank you. Okay, we can, uh, Start with some questions from the two boards. I think, um, from a planning board sense, it's it's a, it's much cleaner than from an architectural sense. Um, so we might start with you folks and see uh, kind of comments. Sure. Um, I'm gonna start first by uh, making a, an apology to the to both boards and to the applicant. I understand that there were some comments received from the city that my tone of voice. Um, in questioning the applicant seemed um, angry and I d didn't intend that at all and I, I apologize for having presented um, my questions that way. That was certainly not my intent, so I, I'm sorry for that. Um, but I would also like to say that I, I am very impressed with the number of changes that the applicant has made. Um, I think that they really did listen to all of our feedback and. Um, did a substantial amount of changes in a very short period of time, and I appreciate that um, quite a bit. I do have uh, a few questions, but they're certainly not as lengthy as they were last time. <laughs> um, and I'm sure other board members do too, so I'll try to go through them as, as quickly as possible and um, let other people talk. Um, uh, thank you, first, also for the good context photos. I think that was really helpful, and it, it does show that um, this building design much more represents the context of the buildings in the neighborhood and in downtown Northampton. Um, I have a question which isn't central business architecture, but um, was a little bit confusing for the drawings that we received as a board. It was uh, hard to understand the landscaping. I think the landscaping that perhaps was presented uh, is what will be done, um, and just in terms of where entrances were, and I know you're still in schematics, and so 
it looked like there were some places where doorways opened onto grass and yeah. <coughs> so that just needs to be coordinated um, okay so just quickly going through the guidelines um, I'm going to touch on the guidelines as as they're numbered in the book so guideline number one is about setbacks um, I had a question about the setback on Pleasant Street it seems that you have um, you've pulled that facade much further forward. Um, how far is it set back from the other facade? From the... The curved, the, how far is it set back from the curved oh, facade? So the setback from our property line to... No, the no. second story above the storefront, right? That, that... So from what was the metal structure oh. to the curved structure? I'm, I'm going to have to guess. I think the jog back is about two and a half feet. Okay. Uh, but I can certainly get back to you with exactly w where that is. And I actually had a discussion with Carolyn about that this afternoon because there's nothing really clear in the guidelines about setbacks on upper floors. Right. Um, so whether or not that's allowable isn't really clear. Um, one of the the comments in the guidelines is that setbacks are allowed if it um, creates additional public space um, or uh, preserves high quality views. I didn't know if the intent for that setback was to provide better views for the adjacent building, perhaps downtown or. That's exactly right. It, it, it was, it was uh, it, well, twofold. One was, uh, again, to create that uh, division in the facade because it is a rather broad facade relative to its height, mm -hmm. which could be done with pilasters or uh, it's certainly you know, on, a, on a straight facade. It would more traditionally be done with a pilaster. So we chose to do it with a setback, both to uh, create the, you know, the strong uh, impression of verticality but it was also set back so that we would get a better view of the corner of the adjacent brick building and just again it's a sort of a little inviting gesture to uh, to make the exterior corridor <coughs> more inviting as a clear entry point the building helps express entry through that corridor uh, I like it better where it is now than where it was, but I think the uh, getting that extra peak of the building uh, further south, I, th I think is a positive thing for helping to encourage traffic, uh, pedestrian traffic into the courtyard. And, and I'm wondering the step, the setback on Holyoke Street looks like it's because of the orientation of um, the street. Which it is, is exactly angle. that. And, yeah. um, and it also creates some spaces that um, provide better entry points, a little wider space for entry on those sidewalks. That's exactly right. Yep. I'm, I'm just questioning that because I want to be able to say on future buildings, when other people come back and say, well, the setbacks were done on this building why that there these were the reasons why no and the uh, in contrast to the previous plan where the it was following the angle of the street i think it works better this way to do the kind of segmented step i agree um you have changed the sign band which i think looks a lot better what is the material for that sign band and um do you intend to use that are there other signs on the building well, did see, and and I'm really not trying to beg the issue at all, but we, we don't have our tenants yet, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I the intent would certainly be to to do signage that completely follow the zoning, and I just not knowing yet who might want to put one symbol up there. Uh, I don't know if that's regulated. We're certainly committed to following. It's more about what the material, you know, uh, well, the question is you, you have the sign band, and that's a certain material behind the lettering. Right, right. right. Well, it would typically be metal. I mean, it typically would be. We want to have brick on, the, on that, that level of the elevation. It's surrounded by that, but typically metal. But I think it kind of depends. I mean, you, I, when I've looked at the other signs around the city, there's a pretty good variety of approaches to it. Um, and part of the reason I'm asking the question is because it's now it's become an element that kind of wraps around the building. Very much. So I'm just curious what that material is when it's not a sign. 
Oh, okay. All right. It's, well, I've got two comments. Okay, got that. All right. If it's not a sign, I would imagine it probably is metal. Then okay. it would it would be in you know a painted metal, and the color yet isn't selected. Uh, so I, I think that's the answer. So there is a little bit of metal, I guess. So all those sort of that. white, like light buff colors, would be metal bands. I think so. I think so. The other option that is certainly more affordable might be the cementitious, the uh, you know, cementitious panels as well. Um. Okay. Um, you've added a horizontal band on the Holyoke Street brick facade above the the third floor windows. I think. Yeah. Yep. Um, which I think is a really nice feature because it ties into the other materials wrapping around the building. It. And I was wanted to question whether you were going to do that on the Pleasant Street facade at all. The Pleasant Street facade, I think we were trying to, uh, we were working more with the idea of the, of the brick panels, uh, the detailed panels. It's, it, it, you can't see it all that well in there. Above the top story windows, it, we wanted to have some recessed brick panels. And, and you can see that on the curved facade, and it looks like on the Holyoke Street you've done that on the taller facade as well. Mm -hmm. But on the lower facade, like, and this is, a, you can see the horizontal band that's above the third story windows yep. where you have the cementitious material. I, I think it's a nice feature, and it's kind of oh, okay. to the same Oh, I language. see, and, and maybe have that dye. Okay. Yeah, facade. it kind of matches what's yeah, happening yeah. on Holyoke Street. That's a good comment. I, and it, I'm making some of these comments because I know you're in schematics, so I'm sure you didn't get everything done, and I didn't know if in the, it was intentional to leave it off or not. I would have to say that I, I'm not sure you studied it or not, and uh, as you said, there wasn't a whole lot of time, but I think it certainly is a good thing to look at, and it would make it more consistent with the whole of the side as well. Just for clarification, so I understand, what you're talking about is below the windows is a recessed rectangular right. relief in the right curves. Here. Can you yeah. go back to the other no. the other yeah. facade, the Holyoke Street facade? What are you talking about the sign part? Of I'm the talking about this this band right. here. Yeah, exactly. And then if you go back to the other the other facade, so you can see the it lines up with this banding on the other cementitious material, and if it were to wrap around, similar to what's happening on the Holyoke Street facade. It seems like that was the same language. Yeah, it, well, it is. It's, it, it's pretty similar element, too. Oh, and you're saying on this facade, you didn't have the recesses like That's you right. do. Oh, well, we do here. We still have the recesses. Right, right. There. But, you know, we, I think we carried that around also because uh, these are taller facades, too. Are they, that was mainly what we were playing with <laughs> with that banding was uh, <clears throat> the height. I, I just thought that looked pretty good. The proportions. Yeah, of that. <laughs> it does. And I, but I also like how it actually, you yeah, know, it ties in. Ties in. Guys too. Mm -hmm. um, the articulation. So I think you did a really good job of listening to our request about showing articulation on the brick facades, and you've added a lot of detail to it. Um, one of the things that I think still needs a little more study is how, and this is a good example, where the single story structure ties into the, the four story structure. Mm -hmm. So your elevation and your perspectives are different. Here, it, in the elevation, it shows this band being continuous. Mm -hmm. So it feels like this whole facade is continuous. But here, it's getting broken by the corner. Um, you show two different things on one, one in the perspective and one in the elevation, and so. Mm -hmm. so we coordinate those. It's, well, I guess which what's your intention? I I think uh, in the elevation it it looks as if you're trying to be continuous in wrapping that single story yeah. around, but the perspective doesn't show yeah, let's that. Get to the elevation. So like right here. Yeah, it's, well, so no, yeah, it's there to too. The yeah, that's a good one. Right. So, in, right. in your elevations, this band is continuous to sort of tie that whole right. piece around. Right. 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 It's not. But here, in the perspective, it's broken, and that's also, you know, with your canopies, 
it's a little weird to have the canopy spanning a corner like that. Well, I think the, the, I think the intent here was, because remember there was discussion about this piece last time we were yeah. here and how to, uh, to really define the piece, because we really want that piece <laughs> for the reasons I explained for both getting the additional space and necking down <laughs> that finish. I think this is more our intent, is to have a break there and not lose the rhythm of the sills. Okay. Of the masonry sills. The awning pieces may still be up in the air a little bit, the precise design of those. Mm -hmm. But I, I see what you're talking about. It's a little odd that, that it bridges there. Okay. So I, I would say maybe that's a little bit up in the air, the awning pieces. But I think that's our intent on the banding. Okay. Um, you, as you said in your presentation, you added the, the bulkhead walls on the um, Holyoke Street facades below the storefronts, which I think are good. Um, on the east face, at least in these drawings, the east face of the, I'm sorry, not the east, I guess the west, the other side. Uh, whoop, go back one. This one? That one, which you can't see from here, but in the elevations, it looked like maybe the bulkheads hadn't been added. But I'm sure that again, that might oh, just be oh, just in the commercial piece. Yeah, yeah, that would be a mistake if they're not shown. That is our intent. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, I'll, I'll repeat one small. It, it is certainly our intent. To have that, absolutely. Uh, but we are still working. Uh, we'll be working more intensely with the CDC as far as working out their plan. So where the door might interrupt that, I, I don't know yet. Sure. But certainly it's our intent. Um, and this is uh, a question that may be stepping out of so outside of the central business. The lobby area in plan, which is not technically a street facade, but it's becomes it's going to be sort of a pedestrian facade. For the residential? For the residential. Okay. and. Um, it doesn't seem like the plan shows any windows into the lobby area. Oh, there will be, though. Yeah, the, the big uh, idea of the lobby is really to have a lot of continuity right across between the open spaces. So that's just Transparency, you mean? Pardon? Transparency? Yes. Oh, yeah, because it's, it's, because it's, I think it, what's interesting about the site, it's such an odd shape that that's one opportunity, opportunity where you can really see a large uh, distance right across the site. So from this garden space, looking through the lobby into the other garden space, it's actually really big. Mm -hmm. And we're absolutely doing that. That It's under development because we haven't, you know, I'm not 100% sure where the mailboxes will be. Or the, sure. We just haven't designed, uh, designed it yet, but this will be very transparent across the lobby space. And there was notes about a um, polycarbonate canopy on metal structure and is that that whole triangular that's in, wedge that's here I uh -huh. think that's primarily there that overhang and the idea of that was to uh, have it translucent uh -huh. because it is set back we still I mean it's south facing so it's going to be a lot of light anyway but we wanted to uh, have it glow a little bit that's what that is so I don't know if we can, I mean, you can see that from the street, but it's not a street facade. So I don't know if we have any right. comments. I guess if we have any comments, like, it would be good to see details. But if we don't have any jurisdiction or on yeah, that, you'll see it from Holyoke, primarily from Holyoke Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <clears throat> um, and it's just the canopy, though. Right. Yeah. So if is it uh will it be a part of the structure because their canopies also are allowed they could be attached later as long as it doesn't affect the arch the structure of the building it can be added or taken off without review so if it's some if it's an element like that then i would say i wouldn't really so it's right look, there yeah. yeah it's this so that's a recessed entry and that canopy at that point right that's yeah so I don't know if we can request to see details or it doesn't follow. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you want to see details, because it is visible from the Holyoke Street side. I mean, obviously, if a building's built, it will become invisible right. at that point. Um, 
So it, I guess it depends on how it's built. If it's built into the structure, then you'd want to see it and you can make that a condition. You know, prior to issuance of a building permit, you want to see the final design of that canopy. Okay. Um, doorways, and you talked a little bit about not knowing where doorways are going to go or vestibules or things like that. And I, I, we talked a little bit about this before, um, about recessing the doors 36 yeah. inches. and. Yeah. So that's a detail that will be worked out later? Or? Absolutely. The, the design, especially across Pleasant Street, where we drew the uh, curtain wall just straight across, the, the introducing the vestibule there, or recessed is uh, something that we're not in any way opposed to. We just, what we wanted to define our commercial envelope is really all we're doing with that. And you it, see actually the doors are swinging in on that. If you have to do the whole space, the doors would have to swing out. Yeah. Even though it's on our property at that point, so there isn't a, a legal requirement for having swing. Uh, we don't have an issue of the door swinging over uh, public space. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, we're completely happy with that idea. This right along here is where that's the most noticeable. But we may have multiple entries. In the building. So that'll get to find later. Yeah. Yeah. No, we um, I think you did a great job of, of working out the windows, the, the pattern of um, of the mutton bars and the rhythm is much more consistent. Um, and you've added sills and lintels to the uh, the Holyoke facades. Um, I'm curious. I don't even know if you know this yet. Some of the images. Uh, depict the windows as being red in color. Is that a slight? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a it's something that well, yeah. We, I, I talked to my owner once in a while. Uh, <laughs> we haven't decided. We haven't decided. Um, is that something we can ask to look at? Colors now. <laughs> Um, the cornice detail, you talked about that a little bit. You looked at adjacent buildings and that seemed to be um, an appropriate scale. To me, it, it feels a little light, um, that it could be a little deeper in, in, in detail. Um, and I guess I, I would like to see what the final design of that, whatever that Absolutely. cornice detail is. I think the big decision there was really making it masonry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it is more consistent with the nearby buildings. Um, so uh, one of the things, the major things that I think you added, which kind of brought the scale down and made it more friendly to pedestrians, is the canopies. And, um, and like you said, you haven't quite finalized that. Um, the view from, from Main Street down towards the building at the curve, yep. you've got one canopy on the window but not on the other one and that window is wider at the base it doesn't fit within the bay i was yeah, wondering like this uh this this window oh, yep. a is wider than this bay yep and then you didn't put a canopy here i was just curious why uh, that was only because uh, we were thinking that that could actually be a commercial entry. That was the only reason we articulated it that way. Okay. As opposed to a window. We, we it could be. It could be a commercial entry. <coughs> that was the only reason. It was not do it that way. Um I guess it would be nice if that detailing continued wrapped all the way around, similar to how you're wrapping it on the Holyoke yeah, Street all the way around. Including the light colored band up there, you mean? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and the mechanical equipment, I, I assume, or maybe not, it's been moved away from, uh, Well, we still have a parapet. There's so it can still parapet. hide up oh, there? Oh, it's hidden. Oh, okay. yeah. No, mechanical equipment will be hidden. Um, I guess, so, uh, you know, th those are most of my comments. I think you made really good changes based on the, the discussion. And I, again, I apologize for my tone last time. Um, but you did a lot of good work, I think, in, in the last month. Um, and I think that this design much more uh, reflects the CBA guidelines, and um, I, think, I think it's starting to look good. And um, I'm going to open it up to the rest of the board, but I have some summary comments after we all talk. All right. 
Great. Yeah, I, I just have some minor articulation details I want to understand a little bit. Yeah. Uh, for example, in this elevation or this perspective we're looking at, um, because the north side of the front building is in a shadow, uh, the, uh, yeah, like those rectangular recessed uh, and the release, you These call guys. them, in the front. Yeah, do they follow around on that side? They do. Okay, so yeah. all that detailing follows on that side. It does. Yeah, it okay. Um, Elon had a comment also, and I'm trying to clarify it. If you could go back to the the, uh, the, the other angled perspective of that, Looking of the front. Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, she brought this up, and I'm trying to get a clarification mm -hmm. on that. I don't know exactly sure what you call the element that is, for example, in the rear building where the materials change from the brick to the lighter color. Yeah. Yeah. That. What's that horizontal band? You would. What would you call that horizontal band there? Is there a name for that? It's a horizontal band. Okay. <laughs> so. So yeah, it's that. It, on a mid cornice. Yeah. yeah. A, a mid cornice. A mid cornice. Okay. Great. <laughs> right. So, on the CDC office building. Yep. Around the, the corner. That mid cornice is see it's it's on the lower of those two structures and i i no and uh, and stick on the brick okay. see the right side yeah that you have the mid cornice there yeah but you don't have it on the taller building right and the same relationship to the front of the building to me you would i would think i would want to see that mid cornice yeah, on the see. recessed yeah. brick yeah. fixture because yeah. it continues that band uh, to me, it's just a logical kind of consistency. I, I, it's oh, just it, it, uh, it, along here, then. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Right. Well, yeah, that's the same comment. Uh, the, uh, it, and we certainly are happy to look at that. that it adds it, an element because that build, the smaller building, what used to be the metal building there, mm -hmm. uh, there's none of those rectangular recesses on the brick. Right. So right. I thought that mid cornice might. Add a little detailing. Yep. The, to and, that. and again, I think uh, the reason that it, it went that way. I mean, if you go back to that other perspective, there. Yeah, there you go. The the main motivation, which uh, is that it is, it's like four feet taller here too. This building's four feet taller. Yeah, I, but anyway, we were just playing with the it's a thought. It's, yeah. it's, it's all we could. If, I mean, I think if it if we put that band on there and you looked at it and it looked too squat, I think you probably. And just a positive comment. I know last time Tom Douglas had a lot of issues with the was. ways, and I think everyone realized that. And I, I think that was a great improvement opening that up. And also, your mention of the transparency of the lobby area, mm -hmm. I think, and creating that front block is almost kind of a visually separate unit. I, th I don't know. I just think that alleyway being well illuminated will be a safe and inviting passageway. Great. That's our goal for sure. Otherwise, I, I really think this is a incredible improvement over the last presentation. And oh, thank I you. Like very much the look of it. Thank you. My fellow colleagues who have a lot of detail, so it leaves me not much to say except I'll be piling on if that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. Pile it on. <laughs> I, I, I agree with said that, that you have made significant improvements and responded very well to the information that you picked up last time. Thanks. Thank you for providing details. <laughs> okay, well, I will try to avoid using colorful language tonight. <laughs> <laughs> my, my clothes are trained. So okay, all right. Uh, anyway, I do think it's an incredible improvement in the, uh, the overall design of it. And uh, the comments that have been, uh, you know, um, uh, laid on by uh, colleagues, I think, are very appropriate. I concur with them. Uh, there are two areas where I would um, uh, like to place a little bit more emphasis, and then mm -hmm. <coughs> on the the main cornice. And this might be a question of the rim. Go back to the. Don't seem to give me the sense of heft that I would want to see in the crowning element of the building. Yeah. You've got the base, you've got the, the, the shaft, you don't have the capital up there. Uh, it, to me, it, it should be a, a little bit more articulated, particularly if you look at the tradition of ornate brickwork in cornices in downtown Northampton. Mm -hmm. you know, in the 19th century, 
uh, that, that was uh, you know a signature element of the craftsman, the brick craftsman. Uh, the architect would say, "Give me a cornice," and they would just go wild and have fun with it. Mm. And I, I think it's an opportunity lost here. Uh, it's very simple, it's what you're showing, but I think there's an opportunity for a little bit more exuberance in detail, some more heft to it. Uh, so you might mm -hmm. have to take point taken. That yep. Uh, the second thing that uh, uh, sort of bugs me is with the awnings. I think awnings are great. Um, but the, uh, the way you have um, uh, split the awnings up uh, on the primary Pleasant Street facade here, I think is a lost opportunity. Uh, I think you could have a very nice unifying element if you wrap the corner, uh, but brought the awnings all the way across in a unified element, mm -hmm. as opposed to simply spotting them over the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that would give uh, you know, a much more sense of continuity and a, a very nice horizontal element uh, at the base. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can articulate it around the signboard. I realize you have to work with whoever the tenant would be. Yep. Uh, but having some type of band there of awnings mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, just polka dots of awnings. Okay. okay? Yep. Other than that, I, I'm very pleased to see the, um, the progress in the design. Not there yet, but progress. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, before we go to the public, any comments from planning board? Our, our review, again, this is a site plan, so it's much more limited. Um, site backs, height, things like that, uh, which the applicant meets everything. Um, and there were several comments by the DPW, which we can get into. But any comments initially before? Yep, Alan. Just one question, really, uh, more out of curiosity. How, how did you... Um, uh, greatly increase the amount of commercial space and keep the same number of units? Because when we uh, did the original layout, we very, very generous, generously uh, designed the entry lobby, the residential entry lobby, and imagine we also staked out territory for what could be storage spaces. We left a lot of slack in that design, not really knowing where we might land ultimately with the commercial space. But we received so much uh, feedback and confidence about there being the ability to absorb more commercial space. So we, we took the slack out of that center part of the entryway. So are you still <coughs> anticipating two commercial spaces, but larger? I don't think we're anticipating anything other than trying to find commercial tenants at this point. But Hi, Joanne Campbell, Valley CDC. So, so we have the two commercial spaces on Holyoke and Pleasant Street, and on Pleasant Street is where we were focusing the expansion. So we, what zoning requires is nine, about 902 uh, square feet at the minimum. We started out at 1,500 when we submitted our plans, and after input from uh, particularly the Beehive meeting we had sometime in December, we've expanded that space to 3,100 square feet. The Holyoke Street side, which is where Valley expects to be, remains where we originally projected, which was about 2,200 feet. So, um, what was the what's the Holyoke Street side had a minimum requirement of? I mean, I think we put it on the drawing on the revised drawing. So, um, but so we are beyond on the Holyoke Street side. We're beyond the minimum as well. So again, that 3,100 square feet could be. One tenant could be three tenants. We could have two entrances on Pleasant Street. We could have one entrance on Pleasant and two on. Really depends once we're in construction and we're at a point where we want to start marketing that space, who comes forward with ideas for the space. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Walt, could you speak to uh, earlier at the last meeting, there was a question about the, the abutter on the north about the project was unbuildable, quote unquote, because of language with the easement and the property line and so forth. Can you put that issue to bed and, and let us know where that stands? Yeah, the, uh, the, the project we're proposing is buildable. We're not encroaching on anyone else's property. The, uh, we have the space we need to erect the building. Uh, 
we've done a lot of buildings in very very tight urban environments and and uh, we're not concerned I didn't quite understand that comment before other than the encroachment on the paving when we were paving over the easement that that's working on somebody else's property but we are not doing anything on anyone else's property okay thank you uh, okay I'm just, I just I won't read these but I will uh, reference these and we can enter these into the minutes before I open up to the public there are three people who couldn't make it here tonight um, Joel Russell Jack Horner and Mary Gardiner uh, all spoke uh, very much in favor of the project and uh, so we can enter their comments into the minutes as well so now we're going to open this up to the public again if you if you spoke before um, and you have something new to say that's great you don't need to repeat what you said um, because again this is a continuation of that previous meeting so let's jump in if you could raise your hand I'll call on you if you come to the podium uh, just name an address and we'll go from there so who wants to go first yep Hi, I'm Madeline Weaver Blanchett, and um, I live at 41 Valley Street. Um, I'm a neighbor of this project, and I want to uh, let you know that I'm a big supporter of the project, and I hope that you will approve the site plan. Um, the city is in a critical need of affordable housing, and our neighborhood in particular is home to many renters, students, and artists who are uh, one rent increase away from um, having to join the exodus of uh, so many people to towns where there is more affordable housing, like East Hampton, Holyoke, etc. Um, this project doves, dovetails well with um, a new and uh, it's going to be a very modern looking art center that's going to be at 33 Holly Street. Um, I've had the chance to go to public meetings and um, that space is all about affordable art space for people and, and, and at public meetings the issue of affordable housing for artists always comes up. So this is just like... Um, you know, it just seems like the, the other bookend to that project, in my opinion. Um, also, um, as a neighbor, I have been to the visioning um, sessions that we've had about Southern Pleasant Street. I think that called it um, Pleasant Futures. I, again, I believe that this project really fits in with what we heard from a very big and diverse room of citizens saying, we want m people to live and work on Pleasant Street. We want walkability, we want trees, we want lights. We don't want people to, we, we, want, we want Pleasant Street and Southern Pleasant Street to read as you are in Northampton, not it's a, just a ramp up into the nice urban section of town. So um, in my opinion, from what I heard at those sessions, um, this is just really like um, an exciting big first step in that. And um, I would say that I've talked to many, many neighbors, just informally polling, and um, people understand that this lot is for sale. Right now, it's, nothing's happening in it. People understand that we've had a zoning change, and there will be change. So um, it's my opinion that um, this is the best use of this lot, uh, it, it provides the greatest good to the greatest number of residents in Northampton. And the normal impact that will come from any kind of change, I think, um, I think we'd be lucky to have Valley CDC be the developer because they've been so responsive, both to positive um, suggestions about the architecture and also just neighborhood concerns. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Rashane. I live at 137 Crescent Street, uh, apartment two. Uh, and I'm just here tonight to uh, uh, offer my support for the project. Uh, and I, I think it adds uh, to the um, 
the community vibrancy and the uh, the sort of uh, amazing dynamic that exists uh, in, in Central Northampton. Um, I, I think it certainly you know meets the the zoning and, and planning requirements, and I think uh, it's a, an attractive building that will add to the the visual fabric uh, of Pleasant Street and the the community at large. Um, and you know, most importantly, uh, it's uh, you know as the woman who spoke before me uh, noted, uh, this is uh, going to be uh, I, I believe the number of homes is 55 uh, apartments inside and and, and uh, correct me that could be wrong about that precise number uh, but that's uh, you know opportunities for countless families over a period of decades uh, and uh, that's um, you know really fits in the um, sort of the, the, the moral fabric of what this community is so I want to just emphasize uh, uh, why that's so important and uh, emphasize that this is something that's going to be an asset for this community for decades and decades to come and that's uh, extremely important uh, for a lot of families thank you mm. anybody else yep good evening my name is Joe Hennefield I'm a resident of Ward 3 at 14 Wilson Avenue um, as disclosure um, my my vocation is urban planner. I spent uh, 1991 to 2008 as the director of equity investment for the Massachusetts Housing Investment Corporation, and I was the underwriter for the original rehabilitation of the South Street apartments. Um, I'm very familiar with the area. I live in that area now, uh, and I'm an advocate for uh, increasing density basic, basically throughout Northampton. Um, and certainly the Pleasant Street Corridor is an area that needs that. And I think uh, given my previous um, uh, involvement with Valley CDC as an investor, um, I, I may be prejudiced, but they do a wonderful job. And I think this building has, and they've shown that they will be responsive to the community. I think this will become an anchor for Pleasant Street, as will the um, rehabilitation or the new construction uh, replacing the Northampton um, uh, Arms, I guess it's called, next to Hampton Court. So I really urge you to look at this as the beginning of the future for Pleasant Street um, and not at all um, a problematic intervention on the street. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hello, I'm Jim Nash of 18 Montview. Um, <clears throat> Cliff, would it be possible to show the view from the corner that has the, um, the um, optical studio parking lot in the building? Terrific, thank you. Okay. Um, so first off, I want to say is per our uh, central business <laughs> zoning, this structure makes sense. Uh, that, um, that the city um, uh, considered expanding central business several years ago. There was a lot of support for it, especially bringing it this far down Pleasant Street. Uh, the hope was that, um, that uh, construction like this would occur. And so, um, and that, that it could actually be, you know, another 20 feet higher and that, um, you know, that if you look around at some of the other buildings in the area, yes, it'll probably be, be taller than most of them, but not significantly taller than many buildings within a block. So, um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to say is um, that development and change can be hard, and I think we're seeing this here, that part of what's going on is we, we, we're, we're moving from a central business design, or, or moving from a general business design, which features parking lots in front of buildings where businesses are. And, and that's, that's part of what's happening for our neighbors at the Optical Studio who've done a really wonderful job of, of upkeeping and maintaining their property. That it's, it's it, you walk by it and everything's first class. And that, um, that, but part of what's going on here is there's an interface between this central business development and the existing structures. There's, it's an awkward match right now, and I think we just need to acknowledge that. Um, 
that um, so what I see going on here is I I, um, I run an office over at 160 Main Street, um, which is it's the corner building. It's where um, uh, the 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 uh, photography place is that's in Raven Bookstore. Um, it sits on the corner. If you took that building out and, and put in a general business type of structure there, you would have the same effect with thorns forming an L-shaped building, you know, structure just like this here. So what, what I see going on is that, you know, the, the development needs to continue. And, and especially it needs to continue on the corner. Um, that when I was with the Zoning Revisions Committee, one of the, the things we had talked about is how good development occurs when you start with strong corners, with structures on the corner, as we do downtown. You know, you go to our Main Street intersection, bing, 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 right around, nice big structures. You don't notice that uh, CVS is one story. You don't notice that Faces is one story, um, that I think it's the TD Bank building is one. So, and that has to do with the nice, strong, big buildings right on the corner. If I could change one thing about this project, it would be that it would be going on the corner. And that, that, um, that the optical studio were actually shifted more towards the center of the block. We wouldn't have this disruptive feeling going on right now. Um, so, um, I'd just like to close by saying two more things. Uh, one is that the size of this structure could, is just about what we're allowing in URC at the upper limits. And I know right now, I just want to throw that out there, that as we're considering, you know, like, wow, this is a big change for a central business zoning, imagine putting that something of similar size in a neighborhood. Um, I'd just like to close by saying uh, I support this project. I think it's going to be great for the neighborhood. Um, I look forward to shops opening up here, especially some place where I can buy some groceries. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Richard Royal from 270 Pleasant Street. I guess I just have a comment and then a question. Um, the comment would be, I just feel everything's moving way too quick to actually determine the size, because I think it's way too big and it dwarfs over everything. Most of the buildings that are actually shown, if you stuck them on the side of this building, this would still, in my opinion, dwarf over any of those buildings. And the structures that it's actually next to are much smaller than the buildings they've shown, and this would still dwarf over it. That's just the comment I have. The question I have is, I think the architect was talking about how um, the optical studio and how this view right here with the brick wrapping around, we're looking at the future of he wrapped the brick around for the future in case anything was built on Optical Studio that would actually raise further. You wouldn't see the rest of the back of the building. What would happen on the other side of the actual building for the facade? The only reason the building's curved in the first place is because there's not enough space for the building as it is. So they're trying to get as much space as they can by curving the building. That doesn't happen in Northampton. It might happen around a corner. This is not a corner. If Break King comes down, most of the buildings in Northampton are side by side or uh, the facades are straight. They're lined up all the way down the street. That's what most of the look is for. If something goes in Break King, looking at the future, that has to be built five feet from the road. How is that corner going to look good with a new structure there? I, I don't think it does. It doesn't. You're, it's not really looking at the future. It's sticking something there because they just don't have the room for it. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Hi, again. <laughs> Um, I'm Mary Finn. I co-own 274 Pleasant Street. 
I'm a resident in Ward 1 in Northampton. Thank you for listening to my comments tonight. I know some of you have heard from me before, either in writing um, or at some of the meetings. I support the construction of a mixed-use affordable income building on that lot. I think that would be a good use of the lot. What I oppose is the mass, the huge scale of that building. I also oppose the demolition of a historic building without being able to see any analysis of potentially incorporating that building into design or saving it in some way. The building is monolithic. It is out of scale with surrounding buildings. It's out of step with the character of Northampton in that area. Almost the entire mass of the building is visible from every other aspect of the surrounds, including um, across the railroad tracks. And it's cement in material. Certainly the view from Optical Studio, the view from Michael Munn Avenue, um, one of our patients today said it looks like a jail in the drawing. And it, I think it does. Um, I am concerned about the lack of information provided about the historic building. I feel like we've heard sort of a flip comment. Have you been in it? Can you rehab it? I don't know that answer, but I think the city should know the answer to that question. Why do we have a plan submitted that simply says, we're going to tear this down. We're not even going to tell you what it is or why, but we're just tearing it down. The building does not respond to the small scale and details of the, the buildings that are there, that will be there for some time to come. The architecture committee should either deny the permit or direct the applicant to reduce the visibility of the project and provide uh, the required architectural elements um, in the ordinances. I'd like to submit a letter tonight um, that my attorney has drafted that details some of my concerns um, in a language that I think might resonate with you better than um, my terms. So I'm not certain how to submit that tonight. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to state that I have heard the Valley CDC and Cliff repeatedly comment on how much public input there's been. Uh, Carolyn Mitch has also said it. Um, my view of public input is a give and take, a dialogue, an incorporating of comments from different frame of references. Um, you know, we talk about many meetings. You can have all the meetings you want. But unless there's a straightforward intention to actually act upon comments rather than to just allow people to make them, that seems missing in the process. When someone's called to a meeting and shown what's been designed, they're already behind in terms of information and ideas. We're already sort of locked into what's been cooked up. Um, so I do feel railroaded by this project. And I, I do feel like it's a poor use of our time to just critique a design rather than work together uh, to make a design that everybody would be happy with. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Marlene Moore, and I live in Florence, Massachusetts, and I own property in the neighborhood. Um, and I'm really excited about. Um, this housing project and I'm really happy that it's there are going to be some artists living there because I assumed it would be families with children and so my concern is I assume there's some of the artists will have children um, no one has stated the size of these these green spaces I think they're very small there's no place for these children to play and I think there will be a whole lot of children but I know the solution to that problem, and it is to make this housing project smaller 
and make some room for the children because I assume that's why we're building the, these apartments so that children have a place to live. I, I don't think we're, we're building it just for the artists, although I'm really happy about the artists coming to live there. Um, and I think that your regs address require you to address the scale of a, a housing project like this. And I'm just, I think I know why you haven't uh, addressed it, because no one has mentioned the massive scale of this project, which there's nothing like this in Northampton. If you could tell me one building as big as this. And I think you haven't addressed it, because at your <coughs> last meeting, I watched, I wasn't here, but I did watch the film on TV. and. Um, the executive director from CDC stood up and said, oh, we're going to meet with the community, but I just want you to know that that meeting will have no effect on the site plan. So she told you, we're not going to change the size of this project. You're, you're required to address that, and it's not your fault, but you haven't. Not one of you have addressed the size of this project. It will solve so many problems. It will take care of the children, and I assume that's why we're building this. Um, another thing I'd like to say is, someone asked a very good question. What about the encroachment issue? And the answer was, what encroachment issue? But I think that's really kind of funny, because just a few days ago, they hired two lawyers to, I guess, I assume, defend them in this encroachment issue with uh, the royal family. There's a really a lot that hasn't been done, so could you please just look into making this smaller, address it at least. So I, I'd ask that you continue and not approve this uh, site plan until that issue is addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. <coughs> Hi, uh, Peter Blanchett. I live at 41 Valley Street. Um, I just was thinking about um, how this is a big change in the neighborhood. I do live around the corner, um, and uh, it will be very different. I walk around that corner, you know, whenever I walk anywhere uh, in town, which probably isn't as much as I should and hope to in the future, and would if I could buy some groceries uh, anywhere in my neighborhood on foot. I can buy lottery tickets and booze, but I can't get, uh, can't get, uh, you know, much else. But, um, and um, uh, also I want to say, I'm not so sure this is just housing for artists, although uh, being a musician myself, um, I'd be all for that. I just think if it's affordable, um, and of course that's a relative term, um, I think what we're really going to get in that building in terms of tenants that excites me is we're going to get diversity of people. You know, we might get like public defenders and we might get um, other uh, misfits in the world who, um, <laughs> who tend to make, uh, who tend to make uh, our, our community, uh, add, they add value to our community. And as far as the design goes, um, I was just looking through this list online because I know um, I mistakenly clicked on it once before while surfing the web, which was a list of um, 10 iconic buildings that people hated uh, before they were built. Now, I wouldn't say that this building is going to be looked at like, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, something like the Eiffel Tower or, uh, or some of these uh, amazing buildings in this list. but. It, it's always a big deal when you change the landscape, and uh, this 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 is changing the landscape. And I just want to say, I live there. It's going to change my landscape, and I'm okay with that because I believe that the goal, you know, you don't. You, we're not just building uh, a giant tower with nothing in it. We're trying to accommodate people, and we're trying to accommodate our economy and our society here in Northampton, the health of the town. So uh, I am looking forward to the change that it will have uh, on me as a resident here. And uh, I hope that you continue the good work on it. Thanks. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Can I just add something? Yeah, let me just see if there's anybody else first. Anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? No? Okay. Richard Royal again, 270 Pleasant Street. Mm -hmm. I would just like to add affordable housing is not $400,000 per unit, and that's what this is going to be, if not more. We started at 20 million. The last meeting, it went up to 22 million. By the time this thing's done, it'll probably be 25 million, which will be over $400,000 per unit. Doesn't matter if it's a one bedroom, doesn't matter if it's a three bedroom, it doesn't matter. That is a lot of money to stick in a building that you can get more use out of it. And this only came up because um, he stated that, you know, we're trying to improve stuff and it's a good way to spend money. It's not really. And it's just a lot of money to put in the sun when it could be used for something else to provide more housing for more people. You could go buy a bunch of houses for people. I don't live in a $400,000 house, you know, but it, it could be spent more wisely to get more affordable housing to accommodate more people. And that's what I think should happen with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Carolyn, there were a number of comments by DPW. Mm -hmm. I don't, did we read those last time? Uh, mm -hmm. No. Mark, I think you have more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. I would just like to, uh, excuse me, I would just like to address the issue of affordability and cost, um, which is something I know a lot about. The uh, average cost of multifamily housing in Massachusetts, unfortunately, approaches $400,000 wherever you are in the Commonwealth today. Um, it is not unusual. And part of the reason it is more expensive than building a single family home in a subdivision is that you have common areas, you're in, in an urban environment, um, and you have the um, involvement of a lot more professionals than you would have normally. Those numbers are well within the guidelines that the state Department of Housing and Community Developments will recognize. Um, it is also um, a well known fact among the investor community who will ultimately end up buying the low-income housing tax credits that um, build the majority or provide the majority of the money for this. Um, and as a scale of reference, for the $300,000 um, that um, Valley CDC is asking for from the CPA, uh, that would amount even at $20 million to about 1.5% of the overall cost which is a very small but significant amount in the eyes of the state who want to know that a community is interested in affordable housing and is willing to invest in that housing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Carolyn, on the DPW comments, I, I think, Cliff, you've received all these, and it sounds like you've addressed most of these, but do we want to run through them? or? Uh, how do we sure. Want to so these? just to clarify, they also needed a stormwater permit, and they've received that. <laughs> So there are a lot of stormwater conditions related to that that's a separate permit um, that they already have received. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the comments relate to um, water line, you know, the, this type of um, water line connections, where they should be connected, trenching in the street when they rebuild sidewalks, um, materials for the sidewalk construction, um, and curbing. And the, you know, the size of the um, service connections, um, and um, and also replacement of material in the public right of way. So it's a lot of construction material details that we can apply in conditions, but um, they relate to, you know, the materials for the cement, how you know the depth of concrete and um, water and sewer service connections, basically. So were these conditions in the stormwater permit application? Do we need to make these conditions? These additional review, ones are not stormwater conditions, stormwater permit conditions, because that's a separate permit. It's okay. parallel, so no, you don't need to bring those over. But the ones that related to um, bituminous concrete within the right of way, um, you know, has to be replaced. When replaced, has to have eight-inch um, processed gravel base. Mm -hmm. um, Cement concrete within the right of way has to conform to DPW standards um, with um, uh, weight and again gravel depth. Um, 
connections to the eight-inch service. Um, we'll have to they'll have to do video inspections before they connect the water lines, um, and um, create a shutoff for the fire service line just outside the building, mm -hmm. um, and coordinate with the water department to abandon any existing water lines, um, and then. Um, Plan should indicate a permanent trench patch repair for the waterline connection um, and site details for how that happens in a, in a busy, you know, basically in the urban environment. Um, and they want to see final construction plans with final details um, as soon as available, but um, prior to issuance of a building permit. Okay. And just a comment, and we, we yep. have seen those, uh, those uh, the comment letter. And as stated earlier, we they're pretty standard, and we have no issue with them. We expect you know they be attached as a condition, you know, to the, to the permit. Okay. And there were some other comments made by staff or uh, the board at the previous meeting, which we spoke about. And we can I just want to reiterate, and again, I think you've addressed some of these, but just to make it clear, all lighting shall be downlit and and dark sky compliant. All lights must be colored temperature of 3,000 uh, Kelvin or less. Yes. A curb cut for the driveway entrance on Pleasant Street shall be closed with granite curb to match the existing curb. You spoke of that. That's what's shown on the plan, yes. And the sidewalk along Pleasant Street and Holyoke Street will be rebuilt, which I think the plan's reference. That front is, yes. One, one thing we talked about last time, and it was just a note, and it, it didn't really go anywhere, was the, the snow removal in the, the play area, what the intent is. If, if, if you're going to emphasize that as a gathering space, in the warm weather, that's fine. In the cold weather, what happens to that gathering? I think currently the plan is not to use that area for snow storage okay. and just rely on the other areas that we've shown on the plan. And if, if uh, in the event that uh, there's, you know, we have a more more snow than we can handle, you know, we'll have to be trucked off site. Mm -hmm. that, that play area will, will remain open during the winter. Open cleared or open cleared, just yes. not snow cleared, storage? Cleared. cleared. Yes. Okay. And, and not used for snow storage. Okay. And you all may want to add that as a condition. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions by the board? Yep, John. Yeah, and this might be outside our purview, but I just out of curiosity, um, when I look at the site plan, and you know, we focused a lot on the building kind of above ground, but in the courtyard, you know, it's at the essentially at the end of two hallways one on each side, which leaves kind of a significant portion of it not visible from the street. And I'm just wondering if you've had any conversations about any particular security measures or public safety measures, because I understand it still will be visible, you know, from the building, but from the street, there's a pretty decent portion that could be very inviting to folks who maybe don't want there in the middle of the night and things like that. So I just didn't know from a public safety or security standpoint if there had been any conversation about doing anything about that space in non-business hours or that type of thing. I, though we haven't got to that detail yet, I mean, we may look at security cameras. Um, we're doing a development in Parsons and we're at the point where um, we're looking at that. So we had that sort of an allowance. So I think that's further on when we get into more detail that will be looked at. Uh, just a point of clarification, there was a question last time also about the photometric plan, uh, the lighting levels being zero at the property line. Is that? Um, I think we do show you do show zero that. Zero at the property okay. line. There was, a, there was a, I think, a request to add more lights on one of the neighbors. You're right. Okay. We do show zero at the property line. Any other questions by the board? Yep. Uh, yeah, I just have one. I'm sorry, you, you, you described it, but I didn't quite follow. Are you expecting, are you designing so that the stormwater sheets off the hardscape into the rain garden? It will sheet off the parking lot to the back of the parking into a uh, gravel swale that will carry it to the rain garden. Okay. <laughs> will that gravel swale uh, filter out anything that would be put down on the pavement. Like sand, salt, salt. yes, it will, okay. it will, it will yes. Okay. That's what typically we do. Mm -hmm. And the rain garden also will filter out as well. 
the roots will also would, would update any uh, metals or anything like that. Okay. I've got one. Yeah. If, if that rain garden does not do what it's designed to do, mm -hmm. and at this point you're talking about a, a, a design that you're making assumptions about how it will, will behave. This has been a hard packed, you know, uh, traffic lot kind of activity in the in the lumber yard. So I just want to we we have examples of rain gardens around town that actually didn't behave the way we intended for them to do. So I just particularly with this one being central to the garden and the property and in town, um, I, I just wanted to state that it it would it would be a an element that the building inspector would keep an eye on is, is just what I would expect, right? Well, because they have a separate stormwater permit, it's also DPW. So um, the other thing is the standard for soils are different for rain gardens than just detention ponds or other because you have to bring in the appropriate mix to um, to support the plant materials and support There's going to be three additional feet. You know, we have to take scrape off three feet and then bring new, new material sand mixture below the topsoil that, that's going to be in, in the rain garden. So that's going to uh, create some volume. And then there's an overflow that's set a couple of inches above the bottom. So eventually it will drain. If nothing, if, uh, if the soil is not taken anymore, it will drain out into the culvert that goes right to the site. Anyone else? Yep. Sorry, still stuck on this. So in the <laughs> gravel swale, um, have, you, have you done calculations about how much or depth of standing water that you would expect? There won't be, in the swale itself, there won't be any standing because it has a pitch to it, it has a slope to it. Okay. So the water will basically it's, <coughs> will continue into the rain garden. It, it was no, there will be no ponding okay. in the swale. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the planning board side? Uh, it should be noted, Bill, you weren't here for the first half of the meeting, so uh, you can't vote on the second half of the meeting, but comments, questions, all that stuff, it's, it's still valid. But once we get to the voting stage, um, you can vote, but it doesn't count. So <laughs> <laughs> I know Mark waited until 8.45 to tell you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we've heard from the public. Public uh, comment portion of the meeting still open, active. Um, we can discuss among the boards and then individually close a public hearing if you so choose. I guess, is there any further public comment? No, I, I mean, I think on, on, on my end from the planning board side, I think, again, we're, we're, we're limited as to what we're actually reviewing. And the building, although there have been comments about the, the massing, the size, it's, it's actually considerably smaller than it could be according to the zone zoning and so it meets all the setbacks it meets the height requirements I think the applicant has addressed the issues the architectural issues that have come up um, and the minor um, zoning issues that uh, were commented on before have been addressed as well um, so I, I think this does everything that uh, we as a planning board would want a, a structure like this and central business to do and I think they've done a great effort, uh, a great job in, in addressing the comments that came up before. So that's my opinion. But um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to say uh, or if we have any comments yet, Karen. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I noted, um, I presented to you in, in the staff report the sort of the um, zoning requirements. This is site plan approval. It's not a special permit. There are site plan approval criteria in the zoning. Um, that you know relate to those technical standards you look you know you're looking at the the scale the size the setbacks the landscaping the lighting and all of that um the other piece of that is there's a little bit of discussion and there have been some letters to the board about um, concerns about closure of the curb cut so i just want to you all got that in your staff memo but the zoning is very clear that in the central business district there's one curb cut allowed per property there's no grandfathering for that. Um, so when a project comes forward, if there are more curb cuts, then special permits require to have more than one curb cut. And the goal, obviously, is to create um, and improve upon the pedestrian environment to create safe space. You've heard a lot in the public hearing about um, the concerns along Pleasant Street um, and at different intersections that are um, unsafe currently for um, pedestrians. So it is an issue. and. Of course, as we 
continue and want to create that vibrancy. We want to make sure people feel safe walking along the sidewalk so they can go from, you know, commercial space to commercial space um, um, in a safe manner. So all of that um, is the reasoning behind that special permit criteria and why the board, as these projects come forward, require those um, curb cuts to be closed and access to be um, focused on one point to sort of imp to make those improvements as we move forward. I have a question about, um, I guess, should we close the public comment then and have internal discussion? Um, you can or you can opt to leave it open in case you're, if you're drafting conditions and you want to confer with the applicant, you wouldn't be able to do that if you closed the hearing. Okay. So it's um, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Um, okay, then I can. Well, that was part of my question, too, is that this project is in schematic design, so it's not fully baked or completed, and all the details are not figured out at this point. And so I don't know, can, can we, could we, if the, if the board chose to approve a permit, um, have a, a whole series of conditions, one of which is to come back with the final design? Or do we need to? Yeah, I mean, I think you did that with a HAP project. So I wouldn't say the HAP or this project were just in schematic. I think this is very, pretty fully designed. I think there's some details that aren't quite finished, just as with a HAP project that you closed and issued a permit. But you wanted that applicant, and you've done this on many occasions, to have the applicants come back so that you all can see the final details on you know, the cornice and the mid cornice, and um, maybe some of that canopy um, work, and certainly the canopy and the interior of the project. All of that, I think, um, I think I would classify those as details, um, and um, that you all sounded like you wanted to have um, comfort level with knowing what those final details are. Um, so I think it's absolutely appropriate to close and issue a permit with conditions that prior to issuance of building permit, you want to see how those details have all come together and you reserve the right to, um, you know, ensure that those details comply with the requirements in the, in the guidelines. Um, so, you know, I would recommend that approach. Um, and I think there are other ones that you could spell out. <laughs> And there may be other ones that you could spell out that you don't necessarily have to review, but given the fact that it sounded like you wanted to see the cornice detail at least, and maybe that canopy detail in the center of the project, that it would make sense to see sort of all those little ones that might ordinarily just be um, very, um, given a very con detailed condition on. Okay. Karen, um, can, the, can an application be approved subject to the right to not approve it? Well, the <laughs> I no, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm, what I'm suggesting is that they would be approving those details, so they want to approve the final cornice detail. They want, but they need to be very specific on the details that they're going to approve, um, just that, that as they did with the project in November um, up the street, where they wanted to see you wanted to see the the element that wraps and transitions the two facades together around around the side of the facade, I guess I should say, and also how they're detailing the blank wall. Um, generally, the project is cooked except for those details, and you just want to be able to approve those final details. Okay, so. Um, I guess I want to address some of the, the comments that were made uh, by the public in terms of scale, and I think Mark addressed that a little bit too. Um, it, and it, it is a, it's a big change um, to this neighborhood, but it is a building which meets um, both what's allowed by zoning and, um, and the central business. That was a letter that was submitted. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Should I read this before I talk? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and it meets many of the guidelines. And the guidelines are just that. They're guidelines. They're not absolute requirements. They're, um, they're there so that we create a fabric that's consistent throughout um, downtown Northampton. And, and although this building will be unique when it is built, 
it will hopefully be the beginning um, of creating that stronger fabric um, in, in downtown Northampton. So I guess um, I, I feel like that they have, the applicant has responded um, very much so to the comments that were made at the previous meeting and um, that I would um, recommend that the board approve this project with a number of conditions. Um, and prior to the building permit being issued, um, the conditions or details that I would like to see um, would be clarification on the sign band material and locations, um, the horizontal banding at the first floor single story levels and above the third floor windows, uh, confirmation that the bulkhead wall heights on the west facade of Holyoke Street meet the guidelines. Um, and, uh, and it sounds like it is appropriate to ask to see the final detailing of the lobby area metal canopy. Uh, details on the doorways into the retail commercial spaces and their relationships to the sidewalks. Are they recessed? Do they have vestibules? Um, uh, the cornice details um, and the canopy or awning details. And then um, just confirmation of the location of the mechanical equipment and sizes and whether or not any of it's visible from the street. And I would open that up to the, the committee and see if there's any other conditions. I mean, before you do that, I might just say that for the mechanicals, if you don't want them visible, you should just say that as the condition as opposed to wanting to see where they are. Okay. So if that's the issue, because that's one of the things that I think, you know, proving it and then pulling it back would make a difference. So I would say mechanicals sh shall not be visible from the street. I would just ask whether or not uh, the final look at these proposed changes can be done by the chair or if it would have to require a full committee meeting or how would that be handled? Because I think what we're simply doing here is having gone through this back and forth uh, collaborative design process, uh, we just need a final look and say, yeah, you guys did what we said. Um, but whether that can be the chair or Well, I think, I mean, I would recommend that it come back to the full board because I think there's some, um, for instance, that interior courtyard canopy is not quite defined. I think the other canopy, I mean, I think for the most part, the other ones probably could be, but there's, they're just not sure yet on the detail. So I would recommend that it come back as, you know, an amendment. They submitted something that's not, doesn't have quite everything, but you, that you wanted amended to see what those last little details are. What you have um, spoken to um, could be put in the form of a motion if that's appropriate. Yep, and are you first? I'm closed? sorry, do we need to close the yeah, meeting? Now you could close and issue the permit, if I mean, uh, issue uh, a motion to, permit. yeah, if you wanted to do that. There's a question before you close. Well, yes. Visible from the street means visible from what street? Just Pleasant Street? Pleasant and Holyoke. Short Street, we'll see all of the systems. Not necessarily. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean? That could be a condition that you don't see it from. But that's not a public street. Right? Public street. Oh, right, right. There's another question to be. Yep. It, it just seems to me that everything should be postponed to make sure we can work everything out because obviously all the questions are not answered. They're just not. And there's going to be way more questions that are going to come up and you're closing yourself off to something. You know, and I'm not like trying to tell you how to do your job. It's just, I think there's going to be many more questions that are going to come up. I guess from, um, 
my review of this building and the board's review of this built this board review of the building as well as the planning board's review of the building is they have um, addressed the items that we're required to look at and these are the questions that this board has um, which are minor in nature um, so I, I feel that we're ready to, to vote on it. If you're ready to vote. Okay. Can I get a motion? Yeah. Since you know this Well, there's probably not the chair, so someone else could. Mm. And you need to close, yeah. Yeah. So could I get, could I get a motion to close the? So, yeah. Then second. second. Thank you. So I can do this? No, I can't do this. Someone else has to craft it. I make a motion that we approve uh, the permit for this project based on the following details to be clarified at a later time and to be approved by the full board. Prior to issuance of the building permit? By, excuse me? Prior to issuance of the building permit? Yes. Prior to, yes, by the majority of the board or form of the board. And those details as outlined. On would be the sign band materials and locations, the horizontal banding, the first floor, single story levels above the third floor windows, which was noted as a mid cornice, um, the bulkhead wall heights on the west facade of Holyoke Street, uh, detailings of the lobby area and metal canopy adjoining that, uh, doorways into the Retail commercial spaces and their relationship to the sidewalks, whether they're recessed or have vestibules. Uh, a cornice detail, canopy details, and uh, according to the guidelines, that all the mechanical equipment shall be hidden from the views of Pleasant and Holyoke Street. I'll take it. All in favor? Okay, uh, that takes care of the CBA on the planning board side. Any so we have public um, comment is still open. Um, do we have any anything that needs to be discussed or any questions or comments from anybody? No, we have a. Meeting for second. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Wait, who is second? Yeah. yeah. Opposed? No. Okay, we have a number of conditions, which I'm hoping you wrote down, uh, <laughs> Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, most are by DPW, some by the board, but all of which are addressed in the staff comment. Right, and there was another one that you didn't discuss, but it probably makes sense, um, is um, a condition that the, the, the um, area identified for the commercial space that's been expanded to 3,100 square feet um, not be changed. I mean, it's it's in well in excess of the zoning. So normally someone, that, that could be flex space, easily moving back um, and forth between, you know, residential area and commercial. But given that they've offered that space and that was an issue from public, you might want to add that as a condition that they have to create that much commercial space as presented in the plans unless they come back for an amendment. Okay. Does anybody have an issue with that? No. Okay. So that would be tough knowing they don't even have a tenant yet. Yeah, right. I but I mean, the, it, it was presented in that manner, and if it if it changes, they just would come back with an amendment. And if they can, if the if the tenant that they have lined up, if it makes sense, then we can look at it that, at that time. <laughs> I think it's reasonable to to expect what was presented. No. Well, my concern is, you know, the realities of, of, of the marketplace, and I think it was the best effort for them to, to try to um, acknowledge concerns uh, of the public, but if, you know, I'd, I'd rather see uh, a reduced space than empty storefronts if the market is such that they cannot fill that retail space. 
What I want to confirm is not retail, it's commercial. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily oh, have to right. be. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. good point. And does it have to be continued? I mean, could it be divided up? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Just all, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, I wouldn't it's want. Just the area allocated for non residential use, it. basically. Okay. okay. I wouldn't want to set a precedent, even though they're well over the, the minimum. It would be disingenuous to present 3,100 square feet if the intent was just to be a workaround to get approval, and then they'll come back with 1,100 square feet in the future or something that just covers the, the bare minimum. I think if they've, if what's been presented is a reaction to the comments received, mm -hmm. and they're willing to do that or they've demonstrated that willingness, then we should we should act upon that and hold them to it. Okay, that's fine. So we've got uh, closed public comment, and now we need a motion. John. Uh, I move for site plan approval for mixed-use residential construction at 256 Pleasant Street, Northampton, map ID 32C-171 with as, a list, as listed conditions. conditions. <laughs> um, do you want me to run through those again? You might as well, to, for the public's sake. Um, I'm sorry. Because I added some. Okay. So um, these are probably not going to be in the final order because I think there's some prior to building permit ones. But all lights shall be downlit and lights um, shall be. Um, a color temperature maximum of 3,000 Kel 3, Kelvin or less. Um, <coughs> curb cut for the driveway entrance on Pleasant Street shall be closed with granite curb to match the existing curb. The sidewalk on both Pleasant Street and Holyoke Street frontages shall be rebuilt along Pleasant Street to the extent that the applicant obtains permission to improve the pedestrian area within the easement from the abutter. In front of the building, cement concrete should be rebuilt um, to follow the edge of the building. Um, Along Holyoke Street, it should be rebuilt to a five-foot width with granite curb to the eastern edge of the property boundary. Um, uh, the commercial, as offered by the applicant, the commercial, the 3,100 square feet of commercial space um, shall be provided unless amended by the board. Uh, snow shall be cleared from the play area to ensure access throughout the winter. Uh, final set of construction plans, including all relevant construction details, stamped by professional engineer registered in Massachusetts shall be submitted to the DPW as soon as they are available, but no later than concurrent with the application of the building permit. Proposed water line shall be ductile iron from the main to the minimum to a minimum of 10 feet beyond a, a proposed service valve um, to the property line. Plan shall indicate a permanent trench patch repair for the water line connection and provide a detail on the site detail sheets. Um, and shall include flowable fill um, in the trench. A shutoff for the fire service line shall be provided just outside the building and downstream of the domestic branch. The applicant shall coordinate with the water department to abandon existing water service to the building uh, in preparation for demolition. Prior to connecting to the 8-inch service, the applicant shall perform a video inspection and evaluate the condition of the service. Um, if it's determined the service line should be replaced, the applicant shall be responsible for installing new PVC service. Cement concrete sidewalk within the right-of-way shall conform to DPW standards. Um, any bituminous concrete within the right-of-way shall have 8-inch process gravel base course. Okay. We have a motion? Do we have a second? No. Who wants second. to second that? Second, Devin. All in favor? Opposed? Discussion? Here we go. Thank you very much. We get a motion to close. We have to close. Um, adjourn. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. And so there might be a dedicated park service that can go around and prune the fruit trees or pick off the, um, you know, the fungus <laughs> or s do whatever needs well, to be done. Too. And that's right, a huge issue. And, and soils. Um, 
are also an issue. So we're talking about compaction areas and high compaction possibilities as well as salt and sand. Well, not so much sand anymore. Now it's ultra salt. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, what you have is a very r reduced list from what they started with. So I wanted to make sure that you understood because I'm sh I think you know they might come back and and ask w once they come forward. But what it, what it came down to are um, two um, nut trees, basically, and a couple of different fruit trees that seem to do a little bit better in um, more stressed conditions. Um, and so those nut trees are the red horse chestnut and Turkish filbert. <laughs> um, and I looked at those for sort of, um, obviously, the zone, um, plant zone that we're in, and their soil. Um, conditions that they can tolerate. Um, and then for the fruit trees, um, these seem to, the, the cherries, the two cherries, and, and again, it still needs, they would still need maintenance, and so there's still an onus that I would recommend be conditional on the property owners right. if they want to take this on and plant that. But that's going into perpetuity, you know, so it could, the first homeowner <laughs> may be fine with it, but then subsequent ones may not be. So it's kind of a, um, it's not as straightforward as it would seem, I think. Um, and, you know, I think it makes sense for the community to be responsive and think about those things, but at the same time, there is this other realistic. But if, if you're in a subdivision and that's part of the homeowner's agreement that forevermore somebody you're you're everybody chips into the kitty and part of that kitty is going to towards pruning the fruit trees where's the issue with that verse you know a lot of subdivisions have a cul-de-sac and there's a little island in the middle that has to be, ma be maintained by the association and how is that by extension so much different than pruning fruit trees I mean why would that be inherently problematic well, I mean, I think it's a little more finicky than, oh, <laughs> than, it absolutely is, but. than just mowing and trimming shrubs. But, and then the other piece of it is, um, it's, it's not so much different than the cul-de-sac um, islands, I would say. It is different from other street trees where once it's in the right-of-way, you know, deep the tree warden or we don't, mm -hmm. you know, slash um, um, street superintendent goes by and, and replaces trees. The other thing is these trees aren't necessarily as hardy potentially as, I mean the nut trees I think are probably fairly straightforward, um, but the other ones aren't. So then you're saying, well the homeowners that abut or that association has to replace those trees, it's not the DPW's mm -hmm. burden, which I think is a little bit, it's another layer of um, responsibility on an association. One thing that's strike. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it is, I agree with all of that, but is that if you're a potential buyer and you're buying into this development and as part of that homeowners association agreement, that language is included and you accept that, then is that problematic? I mean, you know, this is. I mean, what's the burden of the city at that point? That's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Are most right. of these homeowners associations on dedicated streets, public streets, or are they on private streets? Um, the most of them now are on public streets. There aren't a whole lot of private streets. Okay, all right, because that would make a difference, too. Mm -hmm. so well, that's what Carolyn's saying. So if you, you know, typically on a public street, the tree warden or, the, you know, the city will come by and, and prune, but in this case, that wouldn't be the case. <laughs> Excuse Watch me. What about all the waste? Let's get in there. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of big nut trees, and that, there's something. Oh, yeah. So, and how does that factor in? You know, all in that, and whatever debris that ends up in the road, is that, you know, is the city covering the extra cleanup and disposal? And, and if it's a city street and it starts falling on people's cars, can, are there liability? Again, I don't know if the horse chestnut is big enough to like, cause damage or not, <laughs> but I know my black walnuts, if I, yeah, if yeah, I was under yeah. a car, I'd have a dent. Um, is that, you know, now yeah. the city tree just dropped a nut on my car. 
I got hit by a nut. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of yeah. nutty things. <laughs> I mean, a crab apple. I mean, the shedding, service berry. I mean, it's these are messy. Right. You know, I don't. I'm, I'm not familiar with all of these, but those are two examples of very messy trees. Um, right. I just don't think the streetscape is the appropriate place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the ones in the bottom box, I sort of feel like I would not recommend those. There, there are a couple in the bottom box toward the bottom where there are no comments. Um, the Cornelian chair. Yeah, you know, two I think I ran out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> Same comments, essentially. Did you um, choose these, or did an arborist take a look at these and give their opinion? Or? So this was put together by Berkshire Design, but on behalf of Transformation. So there's the landscape architects at Berkshire Design came up with this list. With the ones on the top? On the bottom. Oh, that they feel is OK. Right. They feel all these are OK. Well, they felt they're OK, but with the caveat, they take lots of maintenance. So that was their note at the bottom, the star. All trees will need to be maintained to manage shape, branches, and harvesting. But that doesn't go into the details. I mean, I went and read some of these descriptions. I mean, you've got to look at individual fruits and decide, is there an infestation on that <laughs> fruit? Do I need to pick that one? Or <laughs> for a lot of these in this lower category. And I just, I, you know, it, it may sound to some degree bureaucratic, <laughs> but I think the reality is people don't want to buy into that. I mean, if you want a fruit tree, you put that on your private property. Mm -hmm. And then you've decided you're going to take care of that. That's going right. to be your project, right. um, as opposed to in the public right of way. Yeah. This was something? set up because these people were interested in doing this in Village Hill. Is that mean? Yes. That right, for the next yes. phase, right? Yeah. Right. Mm. You know, on face value, it sounds so great. Like, let's mm -hmm. raise edible trees. But I think if you want an orchard, that's that's an activity that you've planned and and it. It has density and you do it and it's got some workload to it and it's all of that but I don't see putting it on streetscapes I, I just see the mm -hmm. the you know the, the rain drain gutters getting filled up I see the messiness on the street when it's run over I see the mm -hmm. pinging um, and I don't really think it's going to be food productive. I think it'll be more oh, novel than productive. it will be. Right. See kids at the street throwing the nuts at each other. Oh, how is that? Yeah, kids. It would be <laughs> great. That's the upside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, give me a Stewardia trees, you know? Maybe we should require some nut trees at the new Well, um, dude, there we go. There were, I tried to keep that in mind, too. Um, not the Turkish filbert. <laughs> Um, but the other ones, um, not necessarily to this region, but they're, they can grow in this region. I mean, some of these that they submitted, um, you know, there's an Asian pear on there. Right. And I don't think that <laughs> makes sense right. under, multi, you know, a number of reasons. But anyway, I tried to steer at least... Um, if they're not New England native, that they've been naturalized. <laughs> did, did Berkshire Design sign off on this, or did they just kind of put it together on behalf of the uh, transformation? Well, it was, I mean, they noted here, prepared by the Berkshire Design Group, and they specifically did it. So it was sort of a collaborative process. They knew their client wanted to be thinking about this and wanted to know if it would make sense to have street trees. So. They put together a list. They said, here are the things that we're thinking of that we'd like to be considered acceptable as a street tree. So that was sort of the impetus of thinking about adding this provision in the subdivision rules so that if there was any application, maybe it's not this one, maybe it's another one that comes forward, that you all are ready for that and have a mechanism to, to be able to evaluate, evaluate so that. And there's a, re there's a framework to do that. It sounds like we're in agreement that a new road lined with pear trees doesn't make a lot of sense. But staying on the cul-de-sac idea, say this is a, a, a there's a cul-de-sac at the end with an island in the middle, a park or parklet or whatever, is that an area that would be applicable for something like this? Or we're just saying too much trouble for? Is it still a public park? street? Yeah. Still public street, but, but also we don't have that many cul-de-sacs. Right. Uh, if edible, if edible, fruit was the objective rather than flowering 
trees, mm -hmm. then the periodic random uh, a cul-de-sac is really not going to do much for anything. Or not a, there are a couple parks or park denotations up at uh, Village Hill, and if if. Or I guess they're not on the street, so yeah. they're off the yes, street. I'm so happy right, to have right. them in parks. I'm happy to have yeah. them clustered. So that it's off the street, though. So that's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say they can do that. Too. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is about twice as long as our city tree list, isn't it? We have there is a city yeah. tree list. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Really that's not, this yeah, would be in addition like to that list long. that you guys yeah. already yeah. approved. That um, so these so the ones that I even recommended, which maybe you think is not appropriate anyway, are these five additional ones at the top to add to that already long list. And if you remember in November, we talked about um, creating a list of um, smaller trees that would grow under um, power lines. So we've got mm -hmm. sort of, this would be a third demarcation in that total street tree list. I guess, I guess my sense, if it's gonna be up to the city to maintain these trees, and you know, I would be against it. I just think that, that cost well, I think the way it's being presented is it, it's not supposed to be the city's mm -hmm. responsibility, but I think what we're saying is realistically right. it'll end it up to be the city's. Be. Right. Yeah. right. That's been historically how it's been, then, right. that's reality. Yeah. And if, if there's city sewers, it, it abs I mean, a part yeah. of it's going to be right. part of the city. <clears throat> so is there a city <laughs> choose not to add these five at all? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is public hearing for this. So if you think now let's keep the tree list as it is that's fine too you know if you has the tree warden weighed in does the city have a tree warden i'm assuming we do because it's the straight yeah. guy who doubles as the tree right. warden yeah. okay has he no i didn't pass it by him because my initial inclination would say the only way these would be or should be approved would be if there's um documentation in the homeowner's covenant saying that, that the planning board approves a subdivision with these street trees subject to uh, essentially ownership of maintenance by the association and that they have to show that in their covenants they've got that written and whatever marketing materials when the subdivision is first built. I mean, that may work for the first few years of build out, but right. obviously well, people don't always read their all the fine print in their homeowner's documents. Yeah, but I mean, we've approved private water systems that way. I mean, I, I, just to say it won't work doesn't, doesn't <laughs> seem like the way to go. I mean, there are mechanisms to make it work in, in, those, in right. those business arrangements, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's the street thing that bothers me right. because mm -hmm. we have just been through a process of taking private streets and turning them into public streets. So that's the piece I can't say I know what's going to happen in the long future. Right. So if you have a public street with private trees that are shedding onto the public street right. and and you've got all these nuts and berries clogging up the yeah. you know the sewer then that's the city but, but i only feel that way about street trees i'd love right. to have yeah. i'd love to right have that's how i was thinking on if it's a park yeah. and that's yeah. right does the current tree list have a provision for whether they're native or non-native at all um yeah well there's very specific i can pull up the list um it's very specific about the trees some of them i mean there are a few that are not native um on the list but that has run through the tree committee you know several years ago and then back and and we culled some of those because of climate adaptation um but for the most part we tried to keep you know native um, this is a public hearing, and we have one lone member of the public who's still with us. Are you here for this item? Yes, uh, not this item. Okay. Oh, okay. bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, let's wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> so am I hearing then a uh, good idea but not practical, and it's not yeah. something that the board would recommend? Yeah. No. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion to that effect? Make a motion to keep the existing street tree list as is, no additional trees. Second. 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 All in favor? Opposed? Okay. I would like to add, though, I'm interested in, in picking up on the idea of shorter trees because of solar. Yeah. Um, and power yeah. Lines. Are 
Okay. Um, the other piece of the subdivision rule changes actually are tax changes because of the reorganization of um, Board of Public Works and DPW. So um, the, the subdivision rule changes went through City Council or started going through City Council to change all the references to City Engineer to and um, um, the engineer to director of public works and his or her designee. So um, throughout the entire subdivision ordinance, um, there are references that need to be made consistent with the reorganization. Um, but since city council has no jurisdiction over the subdivision regulations, it really needs to be the planning board that uh, adopts those modifications. So it's really um, edits to that document to change wherever en city engineer and um, replace it with director of public works and change any references to board of public works to public works, whatever the name is. Commission. Right. So moved. Go. I'm moved. Yeah. And are, you're not, I pray you're not here for this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had a motion from John, second, 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 second Bill. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. okay. You're, you're on a roll, Carolyn. Okay. <sighs> Zoning amendment. <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. Thank you. I propose that be the next thing yeah. you can say. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, except we're it's in a public set, hearing. Yeah, too, so. it's set for 8.15, this, the one. So time. after this, we can bump right. it. Right. Um, so the next item for on the public hearing was the zoning amendment, um, section 11, which is site plan. Um, and this is really to make the um, zoning ordinance with respect to stormwater management, um, bring it up to date with current best practices and also um, with, I mean, it's general language to, to reflect what we're already encouraging that people include green infrastructure. Um, so add a paragraph to 2G as noted in, that was sent to you that um, potential, that applicants shall also show potential water quality impacts, planned best management practices during construction phase, and um, the use of management um, runoff created after development. And for major projects, applicants shall incorporate green infrastructure and low impact design to the extent feasible. Um, and then, and for major projects that don't trigger a separate stormwater permit, so all those that are under an acre but over 5,000 square feet in size, um, shall submit information and analysis conducted to incorporate low impact design and green infrastructure. Um, and um, also to provide uh, proposed inspection schedules for the project during construction and upon completion. Uh, so basically, I mean, there's details to the applicant, what they should be providing is what we ask of people already, but um, we just want to codify it. And then, um, again, sort of referencing um, that the standard is to provide green infrastructure as, a, as opposed to thinking about it as an afterthought. Um, but to think of that in, and, and to apply that um, to the extent feasible. So I just wanted to, so this is our site plan section in the zoning. So it's separate from the DPW stormwater ordinance, the one that they have jurisdiction over. And it's also separate from what um, the new regulations that EPA has been working on for the last couple of years for um, uh, the, our size communities, um, basically in the country, that we still are waiting. We've been waiting and waiting for those new uh, mandates to come down, which probably won't trigger a change with this, but we don't know when they're gonna come anyway. And this is just such general language that we wanted to go ahead and move it. This is going to city council on Monday as well, an ordinance committee. I didn't think we needed to bring a joint hearing <laughs> for this um, one. Thank you. <laughs> there was a concern that maybe we should wait until EPA com comes down with its mandate, but I think these are so general and we never we don't know when that's coming anyway. Right. 
Um, so you might hear about that from city council as why did planning board, you know, act on this or recommend it. But um, I mean, I'm going to hope to clarify that on Monday. Yeah. I've got the same repeated question I had for the for the um, Pleasant Street project. Uh -huh. What happens when it doesn't behave the way it's supposed to? And, and I didn't really get a clear answer. It seems to me oh, it's a building sorry. inspector could say you've got a problem. It has to get regraded, reworked. Yeah, I'm right about that. In this case, if it doesn't trigger, in the case where it doesn't trigger a separate separate stormwater permit, right, um, then it's totally on the building. Well, with the city engineer's input, it's going to be the building commissioner enforcing the permit. When there is a separate stormwater permit, there are a whole bunch of other criteria under the stormwater ordinance that sets up enforcement action, okay. and that's done by the DPW. And that would be the case on Pleasant Street because they right. have a separate stormwater permit. Okay. So it's not necessarily the building commissioner. I mean, the one I'm thinking about is Outwater Drive just has a standing pond where they told us it would be a, a storm, you know, right. a, a retention. Right. And, and it just never drains. Right. And DPW is on, I mean, there are two, there's another jurisdiction too, Conservation Commission, for that one because it's in the floodplain. Okay. Um, Thanks, I'm done. So what's the expectation um, when um, it, you read that it uh, should be implemented to the greatest extent possible or feasible? So, so is that financial? Is it soil condition? Like what, what's I think it's site, Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it's site and soil conditions. I guess the, I, the issue would be we want to see w why you can't. Mm -hmm. not propose something else and say, oh, I thought about that, because that's sort of the situation now, it's sort of that's backwards. That's right, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so this is really meant to say, show us what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not doing it, you need a good explanation as to why you're not so doing it. So you need it. to make a good faith mm -hmm. effort, and if you can't, you have to say why. Yeah, there has to be some technical reason why you can't. A technical reason. Okay. What, what is, is green infrastructure a defined term? Um, yes, <laughs> it is um, now defined in the subdivision regs that you approved in November. It's also oh, in, I remember. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's why I'm reminding you. <laughs> it was newly incorporated into that. So, in terms of um, planning board purview, um, it's there. Um, it's also. Uh, I would have to double check. I'm pretty sure it's in the um, stormwater ordinance. So, so it's literally uh, defined. In Is the output cement. defined? I mean, uh, it's the not, amount. It, it's not defined as it says you have to do this and this and this. Right. It says it says the outcome has to be this and this and. Right, and that's because each situation is different, right, exactly. and so you might yeah. use one type of um, response right. um, based on soils or topography versus a different one. But, uh, so I think what Carl was saying, that we could get into a discussion of what's our interpretation versus what the applicants, and, I mean, they're going to they're have to convince us that they've yes. actually done. Right, mm -hmm. okay. right. Right. So, what, if, if, so what happens when it does come down to a matter of cost, I guess? You know, you've got one person that has the means to spend uh, $50,000 to, you know, make it compliant, and then you've got someone else that doesn't have that means, and, you know, $50,000 is a mountain to them. Um, well, how do you, how do you I, um, say I, yes to one, no to the other, I guess? Yeah. Uh, from what we understand, cost is not going to be the issue because the long-term cost of the conveyance systems in terms of maintenance um, is much higher than with a system where you're not a system of piped water and conveyance and so I don't know that you're going to have these huge discrepancies and that argument um, I'm not sure that, that argument would be put forward to the extent that you might did assume you, on an, on something else. You just tell me that gardens are cheaper than pipes. <laughs> I did. Yeah. So do you mean? But but they have to think about putting the gardens in. So if right. right. So there might be an initial, um, um, discre or just um, in terms of what might have to be done in terms of soil amendments that might be a little bit more costly on the front end. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the long, uh, you know, after that, I think there have been more and more studies to show that it's less expensive 
to do a garden versus pipe. Right. <laughs> Less expensive in the public sense. For society or for that individual? But, but no, yeah, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if on an individual basis, someone comes in and says, well, this is what I want to do, and I can't afford that. You know, that extra 50000 means I can't do this project. Um, I, I, mean, I don't again, think he's. I guess I think it's going to be a case by case basis on the cost, but it's not. You know, the other piece of it is uh, property owners aren't. The onus is to maintain these systems. It's not to hand it over to the city anyway. Mm, right. So people are. You know, they've got to care for their detention pond on their property. It doesn't become a DPW issue. But I mean, in general, you could see where underground piping would be costlier than above ground grading. You know, and just grading the yeah. water to an area and then containing it and releasing it versus piping it somewhere. Carolyn, you, you said <coughs> from what you understand, there are going to be certain requirements or not going to be. Did, did you, were you referring to the ultimate DP regulations or what? EPA, I, maybe is what I was referring to. This. So, EPA has, um, th there's, we're in what's considered an MS4 community. And um, so it's, um, we've got, we're at a certain level where we as a city have to do certain things overall in our stormwater system um, to comply with um, ever growing and more stringent stormwater management systems as they relate to, you know, downstream impacts. And those regulations were, have, we've, the city's been told, the EPA's it's been working on these revised guidelines for a couple of years, maybe even longer. And they keep saying, we're going to issue them, we're going to issue them. Um, what that's, that's kind of a ripple effect in terms of how much effort DPW has to, and the city is responsible for um, conveyance or clean conveyance of water coming off of the streets and all the public. Um, surfaces, that's one reason why we have a stormwater utility is because we're, the burden on the city is increasing to address these new regulations that are coming down. <coughs> so I'm sorry, is this uh, applies to <coughs> what limit projects? This would be anything that's under an acre but greater than 5,000 square feet of construction because it's considered a major project. So anything that's a major project has to submit a stormwater management plan unless the project is, you know, maybe just a um, building expansion but no site work or something like that, no site expansion. I thought stormwater it had to be an acre or over to first, first swip. Right, but that's different. So that's what, this oh, is site plan. Oh, so okay. before all of that stuff ever happened, we had uh -huh. site plan standards uh -huh. that said, you know, if you're this size project, gotcha. you need to provide a stormwater management plan. Mm -hmm. Then we got, you know, more recently, um, well, the SWIPs were r required at, you know, different levels. And then the um, city's stormwater ordinance was adopted a few years ago. But this was always in place. Um, bef well, this was in place before that. Okay. Well, I think it's promising because, you know, it's, it is um, discouraging when we have so many applicants come before us and they say, well, we're, we're thinking about doing pervious payment, but, you know, the financial cost we'll have to look at. So it always seems their answer to these low impact development um, systems comes down to, f to financial. <coughs> so I, th I think this is promising in, in addressing it, saying, well, you've got to show us the technical reasons why you can't right. do it. And I think it's, at the same time, it's, it's pretty benign. I mean, it says, show us that you've made a good faith effort for best management practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, rather than jumping right to that next step and, and mm -hmm. them saying, well, we looked at it, but can't do it. Yeah. So yeah. I, don't, I don't have an issue. Use the term, I think somewhere in there, present an analysis. Right. That's, uh, yeah. What, what's that language and what does it mean? Well, um, it says <laughs> for major projects that do not trigger a separate stormwater permit, so anything over 5,000 square feet but that's less than an acre, applicants shall submit information, submit information sorry, on all the analysis conducted to incorporate low impact design and green infrastructure. Oh. So, for instance, the HAP project. 
Um, they are doing a swale on the side of their, they're capturing the roof runoff and running it through a swale before conveying it to the city storm drain. So they looked at ways they can manage some of the water there without pushing it off. And we don't even, <clears throat> that's central business. We sort of give a pass to projects in central business. But they looked at that. Um, and so they need to also do a whole stormwater calculation of where the water is going. So as part of that calculation, they need to analyze how they can incorporate green infrastructure. So that's a, so we're not imposing an additional requirement no. of an, no. an analysis? Mm -hmm. Any other? What do you need? From us. So you, this is a. So this would a be a recommendation to City Council because since it's an ordinance, it's going to go to City Council. So I need a motion to recommend or not recommend. I move we make a recommendation to City Council to adopt close the hearing to and to close the hearing. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and. <laughs> and. <laughs> and? <laughs> Uh, that, the, that the ordinance, the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising section 350-11.5 and 11.6, providing for best management practices for stormwater as part of site review plan. Okay, and as part of that, you are also recommending to close the public hearing at the same time, just yes. for reference. Second and second. Second, two seconds by Devin. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? No. I'd just like to note we could have let him talk. To you. If we were in public hearing. He could have yeah, said anything. We I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right, so we have, we have three uh, other items. Uh, first up, it looks like we have to. Uh, Approve, approval not required. All right. Um, I have that somewhere. <laughs> Where did I put that? Um, there's a lot on North Main Street that's um, it's close to an acre and has about 200 feet of frontage. And it's in the Urban Residential B District. And I left it upstairs. Um, hmm. Do you want me to show you the? parcel on the uh, where, where is it's it on exactly north, it's on north um, main street in in florence on the way to leeds actually you know that big house that's set way back mm -hmm. right before you get to look park mm -hmm. yep. it's the parcel before that it had a two family on it and it burned oh yeah years burned ago. Out, yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that parcel has um it's for sale well over right it's not for, been for sale for a while well over a hundred hundred um, maybe 50 feet of frontage it's in the urban residential B they're proposing to cut it into two parcels um, I think um, over oh you know what I can pull it up here um, well over the 5,000 square foot minimum for or um, 3750 square feet minimum for um, RB lot because it's deep and it's wide um, so it, and it had a two family on it before. Basically, I think they want to develop it for two single families. Um, we'll probably see it anyway come forward because of site plan. Um, because they want to be a little bit further than setback to sort of match what's on the street because yep. that one large house is set back so far. Mm -hmm. um, but there's well more than um, the frontage and lot size. And I did have it to bring it down, and it got buried in my papers, so I'm sorry. So do we need to vote? What do we do? Um, you're supposed to tell me that it's okay to endorse. Right. It's okay <laughs> to endorse. If, okay if you endorse. feel uncomfortable without seeing it, I can try to pull it up on the screen. Uh, or know the law. Yeah. yeah. Right. I move we approve your authority to deal with the law at... Da, 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 North 202 Maine. North, 202 Maine. North, 202 North Maine. Maine. Second. Second test. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? No. Okay. We're down to two items. And I propose we take the last one first. 
No, you don't. <laughs> the Propose we take next. the next one next. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so 51 Phillips Place. The proposal is to review a request to modify the time to comply with the permit condition from prior to issuance of the building permit to prior to certificate of occupancy. So can you walk us through that one? Yeah, so there were, if the 51 Phillips Place came forward to create um, second two family on that parcel and there were a total of six conditions put on the project. And I don't know if you recall, but um, there was an encroachment from the abutter of the driveway on yep. the parcel. And so condition two said prior to issuance of building permit, the impervious area of the driveway from the neighbor's property shall be eliminated from the subject parcel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the, um, there, were, there, were two, there were two issues related to that. One is whether or not there was an appropriate amount of open space um, on the subject parcel with that driveway. And then the second is, you know, having two curb cuts on a property or two portions of a curb cut. So um, the applicant came forward after the hearing and started process for a building permit, and they um, didn't want to immediately start taking out the driveway without having sort of detailed conversations with the abutter. The abutter initially was um, um, unresponsive about um, taking care of the encroachment. Um, so the applicant asked if they could have more time to deal with that and push that condition off to prior to certificate of occupancy. At the same time, they presented information showing that they met the open space even with that <coughs> portion of the driveway and the property. So that issue in terms of meeting the open space wasn't an issue. Um, so the building commissioner initially, you know, we looked at that. So, you know, there are three sort of levels that we think about in terms of uh, modifications to projects that have gone to the planning board. One is, is it a staff administrative review? Is it so minor that, you know, it's just a uh, minor change? Or is it, does it rise to an administrative review by you guys and we put it on the agenda and talk about it? Or third, is it a full-blown amendment? So we didn't think it was a full-blown amendment and, at the, and we didn't think that it was more than an administrative um, change to just not eliminate the condition but just slide it to certificate of occupancy because mm -hmm. they'd shown the open space compliance. Um, so I just want to. Is this the driveway that's kind of on her property? Is mm -hmm. that the deal? Yep. Yeah. She was supposed to talk to the neighbor and get that thing off of their yeah. property or yep. something. And it's not the whole driveway, it's just, it's just a portion sliver of the driveway. Right. Right. So, driveway. So, the, so the neighbor just hasn't really responded. Right. I mean, basically, for the information we've gotten, and I don't want to interpret what's going on, you know. Um, there, but that they just um, they didn't want to feel like they were coming in aggressively and saying we're going to rip out this driveway right. without you know having sort of a longer detailed conversation. About it. You, you mentioned a second curb cut, right? Well, so technically you can only have one curb cut per parcel. Right. So if that's an encroachment, you've got a driveway curb cut essentially on a property. Um, so you you know. But there hasn't the been two a driveways are not, two The two driveways right. are not next to one. No, no, no. Right. right. So that so makes two curb cuts. Right. Um, so, so the building commissioner and I had a conversation about it and determined that it, it was an administrative change. Um, so I'm just bringing it to you to confirm. There was a question brought up by the neighbor whether or not that was an appropriate change to make at the staff level. So um, the building commissioner said, okay, bring it to the planning board to see if there's any issue. If you feel like that was, that's either appropriate at that level or if you also then want to further confirm. So, the, sorry. No, go ahead. So overall though, that condition that we placed is kind of moot anyway because they meet the open space requirement? No, the condition wouldn't be moot. It would just, that was one of the issues that, that uh, um, right. was the subject that, of the condition. Right. So, so it's if, still an important issue, but it's not right, necessarily and, critical for meeting the open space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if the applicant, I mean, one of the issues the pro project, um, the builder has thought about is if they can't reach an agreement or, or for whatever reason um, they can't work something out, um, that they would still need to come back to you all for an amendment to eliminate the condition because otherwise they're not in compliance with the permit. So 
by the time they're getting close to a certificate of occupancy, we'll either know whether they want to come back for a full-blown amendment or whether they're going to be able to um, get rid of the portion of the driveway that's encroaching. And I'm sorry, but just to be clear in terms of um, our authority to have them do this is it's not based on the open space provision because they meet that already. So the authority to make them do this rest because of a curb cut or something? Is that yeah, well, it's, you, you know, you approve the plan showing no driveway there. So the abutter's driveway in the finished product was, this Go is ahead. the right. site. Oh, it's a curb cut. Right. Okay, right. okay. Right. so that's, okay. Seems to me like it doesn't make any difference. To, uh, you know, they just run the risk of doing all the construction and then not being able to get a CO. So if they're willing to run that risk, then either way it'll be enforced. Right. I mean, I think I, the the intent of the condition that we placed was before you get too far down the road, right. you got to work it out with the neighbor. And if they're going to say, well, we're going to technically we can we can build this, we meet the open space requirements, and we'll work it out at the end. But one way or the other, the um, risk is still on it's on them. them. Right, yeah. Correct. Right. Hold on. Hold on. But they, I mean, they can pretty much just go in and take the driveway if they get, if they don't want to be too neighborly about it, and they can right. shut the curb. Right. 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 Okay. The, that's what I. Yeah. I was like, well, what do they have to work out? I mean. Well, I think they want to be more neighborly. Yes. About okay. Going so and this isn't chopping off the driveway. Okay. All right. And that's, that's what, what I wanted was. to avoid. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Hold the time. Hold the time. <laughs> 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 yeah. Anything else before we open? <laughs> I know. No? Okay. Yes. Public comment. Um, I think I would try to refresh your recollection a little bit more, though. Sorry, can I get your name? I'm sorry. My name is uh, Manuel Francisco Palomo. I live at uh, 42 Phillips Place, directly across the street from 51 Phillips Place. And <clears throat> you may or may not recall, but when you had the, that hearing in October, I pointed out that uh, the plans included a portion, that portion of the driveway, and that at a minimum, that driveway is now through adverse possession part of the 37 Phillips place. And at the time, I believe uh, Ms. Merle, the petitioner, specifically said, oh, well, if I can't get it, I'll come back to the board with a sm and build a smaller building. All right, this board voted and you set a very specific condition, which Ms. Mish quoted, prior to issuance of a building permit, the impervious area of driveway from neighbor's property shall be eliminated. That is your decision, all right? And no building permit should have been issued until that condition was met or an appeal was taken to land court or superior court from your decision or it came back here for you to change it. Um, I think it's important because I, I can't help the feeling that you were, you were sold a bill of goods. You were told that, well, we own this much land, this is the plan should be approved, and the concept that there is a, a legal issue here um, was minimized. And I, again, Ms. Merrill said, oh, well, if I, if I don't own that, that, that stretch of, of land, I'll come back and have a smaller building. But now instead, um, the building is already up. I think the French call it a fait accompli. All right, are you really gonna make her take down the building once it's totally up? If it turns out she doesn't have all of the land that she said she did? Um, and the sequence of events was, as I'm watching this building going up, and I'm noticing that that area that you required uh, be removed had not been removed, I sent an email to the building commissioner asking, gee, you know, I've brought to my attention that this building is going up, but they haven't removed the driveway. Um, has a building permit been issued? And I get a response from Mr. Hasbrook saying, oh, well, um, you know, we, we, we decided that they could, they would just have to do it before getting an occupancy permit. So I replied, who authorized this? And Mr. Hasbrook replied, I don't know. I just heard about it on November 17th. I'll get back to you. He then gets back to me saying, oh, gee, 
um, I had a conversation with Ms. Mish, and we thought we could authorize this to go back. I then wrote a letter and an email. Here's a copy of it on December 31st. I'm sorry, should I get this? You can start the round there. In which I pointed out that you don't, you know, neither Mr. Hasbrook nor Ms. Mish has authority to change this board's order. What you did in approving the plan, that is an order, all right? The statute's regulating and specify if you say prior to issuance of a building permit, this portion of impervious driveway has to be removed, no building permit should have been issued. I was sitting here listening to the commentary on the uh, Valley CDC building. I don't really have an opinion one way or the other on it. I didn't choose to comment on it, but the point was raised, well, we can have these conditions and stuff. It becomes meaningless if you make a decision, you vote on it, and you impose conditions, and then after you made the decision, your decision is ignored. <laughs> All right. And by the way, on the issue of, of curb cuts, there are no curbs on Phillips Place through 37. Basically, if you look at the block, I don't have a diagram, but basically, there's a curve from Pomeroy through the front of 51 Phillips, and then there is no curb for the next several lots. <laughs> All right, so the issue of curb, there is no curb uh, on either side of the street. Uh, I don't have a curb in front of my house. Um, so it, your authority to say, you know, you must remove this impervious thing, which is said, isn't based on curb cuts. There's no curb, all right? And, and what's really troubling to me is, fine, I perhaps was unhappy with your decision to approve the PAP, but you voted on it, you approved it. I didn't appeal to a court. This is the issue. And now the ground is shifting. And again, I'm, I'm very troubled by this, all right? You made a decision. Prior to issuing a building permit, this has to be done. And yet they started building the building. <laughs> All right. Uh, and whose authority? Um, that is a problem. That is a problem that you're not following, the, the, the procedures weren't followed. Mr. Hasbrook had no authority to just say, oh, sure, sure, here, have, a, have a building permit anyway. All right. Because you decided, and your decision is final and binding. <laughs> that no building permit should be issued until all of the conditions were met. I mean, what else is going to, are we going to come back in? And again, I would respectfully suggest that, if anything, you should order that all construction stop until this is resolved. Because, and in fact, one of the emails that I got from Mr. Hasbrook when it was responsible, I don't know, it's, oh yes, uh, Ms. Merrill thought that it would require legal action before you to remove it. This isn't a matter of accommodating. The person who now owns 37 Phillips Place basically is the opinion, this is my property. <laughs> All right, and you're not getting this chunk of the driveway, all right, without going to court. And if you take it out, I'll sue you because I own this, all right? I lived at 37 Phillips Place before I bought 42 Phillips Place. I moved into 37 Phillips Place in 1982, and that driveway was there in 1982. All right, now, I am a lawyer, all right? Uh, property law is not my specialty, but I do know that if you hold on to something for more than 20 years, you now own it. <laughs> um, and so I'm just, tr I'm just very troubled by this. It, it's, it, to me, it strikes as, you know, what's going on here? Is this switch and bait? All right, you come in with one plan, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll sort this out, and then after the fact, when you find out, oh, gee, it, it, it's gonna take me legal action, I really don't own that piece of property. Um, I don't think this is the way it should be done, because it makes a mockery of your deliberations. On October 16th, you all consider this issue, the very, and I personally raised the question of, gee, I don't think they own that piece of property. All right. You deliberated, you made a decision, and it's now binding on everybody. 
and that hasn't been followed. And that troubles me. <coughs> and we wouldn't be here today if I hadn't raised this. And, and I'm also troubled by the fact that, gee, for the initial request for an amendment, notices were sent, due notices were sent to all the abutters, mail. The only reason I found out about this is because one of our neighbors describes to your, um, your email list of agendas and he tipped me off the fact that this was now slipped in. No notice was given that now there was some type of amendment going to be done. Um, it, it, just, it, it just bothers me. I would request that you not approve this request. I would further request that you instruct the building commissioner to enforce your decision of October 16th as written until somebody comes back in and makes a formal presentation as to why um, the amendment, you know, the special permit has to be modified. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I have a question. If we started out talking about open space, was there enough space? Is that all right? Yes. For the house to be the size that it's that And it still is. keep 40% open, 30% open. Okay. okay. If, if, the, if the driveway actually belongs to somebody else, did you just say that there's enough open space anyway, that that doesn't matter? We didn't look at that calculation because the survey showed that sh that she owned that property. So we go by the stamped survey. Um, oh, okay. So, so it it we haven't made that analysis because the surveyor showed the property boundaries. So that's what we rely upon. Okay. All right. Okay. But if, but if she doesn't own that stretch strip of, of land, that throws everything off. And again. I, I chose not to go to court to appeal your decision because, okay, fine, all right. Since you required that prior to the issues of building permit, that driveway has to be removed, I said, okay, fine, that'll resolve the issue. When she goes to try to take that out, the neighbor's going to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not doing that. All right. I mean, that's the whole reason why that issue needed to be resolved before they started construction. All right, and what I envision now is Ms. Merrill is going to come in here after she's built the whole building and say, oh, gee, I was wrong. I don't really own that other piece of property, but I put up this building. Will you let me go ahead and use it anyway? All right, and that's going to be a much tougher thing for you to consider. All right. Now, she's already laid a foundation, she's already got the ground floor, but at least the building isn't finished. <coughs> That's a discussion, recalculating whether there's enough open space without that strip of land, all right? That should be happening now before everything is going up. Who, who has requested the amendment? The, the, no, proper, the owner asked for a modification to have more time to, instead of going in and taking out the driveway, and so, again, as I said initially, as we do on all projects where applicants want minor tweaks or modifications, mm -hmm. we determine whether or not it's a major amendment or something that can be handled administratively, or at this level with just notice in the, uh, on the agenda, or if it needs full-blown amendment. So if a building permit was issued, the decision was already, already made, made about where that fell. Yeah, this is waters under the. I mean, there's yeah. no, there's no decision. The decision has been made. The decision was made by issuing a building permit. But the person who issued the permit had no authority to issue That's the what permit. That's yeah. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would say that. It, so the issue is whether or not there's. I mean, we there's a survey plan that was given. You know, um, um, we you and everybody else revise on relies on a stamped survey plan showing the property boundary. The applicant mm -hmm. presented information about their property. If, in the fact, if uh, if someone had gone to court ten years ago and made a claim of adverse possession on a strip of land, mm -hmm. and she didn't represent that to the board, then <coughs> she has provided information. She has misled the board and would be liable for that action. Um, but 
you know, if a surveyor, a surveyor is going to pick that up if someone went to court to get land by adverse mm -hmm. possession. That should be on the record. But we should have made the this decision showed. before the permit was issued. Yeah, I mean, that's this decision. Yeah. Maybe we did make the decision. That's right. right. No, it wasn't I mean, this exception mm -hmm. before well, that's, the permit. That's why, right, yes. that's why we're here. That's so, what, that's, yeah, that's I think problem. I misunderstood. I thought you were presenting it to us tonight to say this is how what we feel on the three tiers where it falls. And for us to weigh in, but it, I to to confirm what we thought was a minor administrative change to because the open space issue was already addressed, and she would still need to eliminate the payment <coughs> property, the encroachment essentially, before certificate of occupancy. And the building commissioner felt assured that he would have enough um, information or or ability to. Require to hold back a certificate of occupancy based on not complying with that or coming back for an amendment. So. Alan. Yeah, um, two things. First, uh, I'm afraid, sir, you're not correct about adverse possession. Um, that the 20 years possession is one of a number of requirements mm -hmm. to establish adverse possession. There's substantial other legal requirements, and one acquires title by adverse possession only after they get a court order um, establishing it, not just by squatting on the land for 20 years. That doesn't pay. to differ on am a lawyer. Well, okay, <laughs> but and, and I assure you you're not correct on that. Well, um, are you a lawyer? Yes, and I do a lot of property oh, law. Well. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm wrong on some things, but not on this one. Well, I, I, I disagree, so, but, but and, okay. and, and, and the point. But the other, let me yeah, just finish yeah. if we could. Th that's number one. Um, number two, uh, um, it seems like you made it, you and the, Mr. Hasbrook made a decision that it was a relatively minor change, and so the building permit has been issued. It seems to me that there's, as others have said, there's basically nothing to decide. They're still going to have to comply with the requirements just at a later point in the process. I actually, would, I think so what the building permit should be revoked because it, Mr. Hasbrook had no authority. You, your planning, your, your order is final, correct? The order is final and has to be followed. The permit cannot be, should not have been issued until that condition was met or this board had a public hearing and changed it. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. There is and what's argument. troubling okay, me is okay. that this. Well, we understand. Let's continue with the, the board comments and then we can get back. Any yeah. other? No. So, I mean, I'll oh, go ahead. So, the survey is good until proven otherwise. That's what we have to do. Oh, yeah. Right. So, if there has not been a legal case relevant to the property line, then that survey um, information is what we're working on. Then there from. is no change of title. Right. So, that. It's the first sort of thing I want to get there is that we're working off a lot that is defined in a way that all of our lots are always defined. Right. Um, it, that doesn't mean it can't go to court and go through that process that you two lawyers would do and try to work that out, but that has not happened yet. So the, the driveway right. is encroaching until that property line challenge has gone forth. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do remember the hearing and, and the issue, and I think it is quite a big step to go to occupancy permit from the building permit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, mm -hmm. it, it is, you know, it's a, it's a multi-hundred thousand dollar decision to build the property and then we are going to be in a mess. So I'm, I'm not sure where I want to go with it. I don't see it as, uh, I, I know how we got here. I, I, I agree with the survey information. I agree that trying to work out the driveway would be exactly what I would want to have happen there. And I think that might have to happen in court, you know, if I had to bet on it. But um, in, in the same way that it was, I mean, it, it, they could build it and not be able to occupy it. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's a risk. true liability. Mm -hmm. right. So in that sense, I, you know, you're giving them more time, but they're taking <coughs> the risk. Do we do we limit mm -hmm. that that risk by saying either is construction ongoing during all yeah. of this or it's done? So do we say either work it out since the building permit's already been issued and the which means this matter's all already uh, underway? It's been addressed already. But do we 
kind of put the brakes on it and say either um, work it out with your neighbor or come back to us for an amendment now? Is or, that do we just, or do we just let it ride and say and, and push as they're asking to the occupancy stage, which means more risk for them? More risk. Well, I, have a qu I mean, in the spirit of the original condition, is there any scenario where building permits can be suspended for a period of time rather than revoking the building? I mean, can the building permit be suspended? And then, well, that's what I'm saying. If you suspend yeah. work and say, and then say deal work with it this. out or come back to us for a minute. And then it doesn't, it doesn't require a brand new building permit or anything like that. And it's not revoking right. the one that they right. have. It's just, yeah. you know, middle yeah. ground between. Right. That's a mess. I mean, the real world, you know, construction, you're in the middle or in some stage of construction right. and you just put a halt on it. Well, then, I mean, maybe. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know what it's been. We have to the community and, and yeah. You know, well, it's a, it's a, the example we it's set a mess, forward though. Here. It's a mess because they, she got the building permit. And so I, I, I guess I'm still hung up. I still don't understand why it's come before us tonight. If the decision was made to, if the decision was made to um, push that, uh, meeting that condition out until a certificate of occupancy, why, are, why is it here before us tonight? It's here because there was, because there was a neighbor who had a problem. Because I filed a complaint, so, and if the building permit isn't is it an enforced, I will go to court to but, enforce but the, the answer conditions. Would be that it seemed like um, whatever your wording is a, a minor administrative right period, and so that's so that that was the the decision. So I again I just I don't know why it's before us. Um, so there so the. The reason it's before you, and I'll work backwards, the reason it's before you is because we had the, the complaint was filed to the building department about what the process was um, for issuing the building permit. Mm -hmm. And so the building commissioner responded saying that um, he confirmed and determined that it was a minor amendment mm -hmm. because there are various thresholds mm -hmm. at which permits can be, or projects, and maybe it's not always a condition but it could be a detail on the site that the board approves, but it's, an it's considered an administrative change okay. that doesn't change the overall nature of the project or the plan. It doesn't change mm -hmm. uh, essentially what was approved. Mm -hmm. And that there is full jurisdiction for the commissioner um, and other staff to make that assessment. Okay. Then the second level of threshold is, you know, staff doesn't feel comfortable making that administrative change maybe it should be a board administrative change so we bring sometimes um, amendments or changes to you all at this level that it's an administrative board change if i could just interrupt like i get all that but the decision was made that it the was decision was minor. made and then the request was changed so what i was getting to was the oh, sorry. <laughs> request was made and so then the building commissioner said okay if there's a challenge, we'll just send it to the planning board to see what they think. So if the planning board thinks that it's an administrative adjustment mm -hmm. and doesn't require a full-blown amendment, mm -hmm. you know, send it to them to either confirm or say, no, we want to stick to the original condition or we only want to adjust the original condition if it's a full-blown amendment. So it got up to this sort of middle level mm -hmm. for a second read, essentially. Was the permit issued? with the change or it was just issued and now we're doubling back no no no. we fully discussed whether it made sense whether it would could be moved forward as an administrative change moving it to certificate of occupancy it's not unlike other cases where we've said you know someone can put there's a condition that you need to build x y or z many times we say in lieu of building x y or z before you um, you need to post a letter of credit mm -hmm. and that's equally um, compliant with the intent with the board's intent mm -hmm. and so that doesn't necessarily need to come back to the board so um, you know those things happen mm -hmm. I guess um, as a former municipal employee <laughs> in different jurisdictions you know you guys made a decision mm -hmm. um, you're the experts you're the, you do this for a living every day um, I would agree with Carla that then even with a complaint it seems odd that it comes back to us. We've already made, you've made a decision, we've made a decision. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem that you made that decision. I think it's perfectly appropriate, but it doesn't seem like the place to bring it is here. Mm -hmm. It would be to bring it 
to city council, or, or I don't know if there's another well, place in city government, but that's the part. It doesn't seem like it belongs back here. I mean, we, you know, now you're at, you know, we're kind of betwixt and between. We're like, well, yeah. you know, well, real, we've already done what we were going to do, and mm -hmm. you made a decision, and I, I don't have any problem with that decision. But just because there's a complaint, it seems like now we now we're like neither here nor there i don't know well the next the next real like anybody who doesn't agree with an administrative change can appeal it to the zoning board that's the real next step mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think in interest of expediency for decisions or confirmation one way or the other you know i think um, the building commissioner thought well we'll put it in front of the planning board to see if in fact they did agree there was an administrative decision or maybe they wanted to make the administrative decision or maybe they thought it wasn't administrative, you know, to it, because the zoning board is a process. It costs money. It's you know. If it, if the question had come up before the decision was made, should it come to the planning board, that would be one thing. But the decision's been made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would it then we could say the horse is already out of the barn. So mm -hmm. we've made our decision, and mm -hmm. so instead of for the applicant, almost the easier way out would be to the, do this higher level administrative change right now in front of us all but we push it back and say no you're, it's not it's out of our hands if you want to fix this now you go back you go to zoning go which to is going to be mayor. more of a pain for them but mm -hmm. that's at their risk and that's a, a direct result of the actions they took yes yes mm -hmm. yeah i think it'll be sufficient if you just convey to her that she really will not get a co unless she either modifies the condition or complies with it Right, she already knows that. We made that very clear when the adjustment was made um, yeah, at so the building permit level. Essentially. But I think, but I'm not, but, but you're saying at this level, you're not doing anything with it, and it stands, the administrative adjustment at the building department level stands, mm -hmm. and so whatever yeah. action mm -hmm. anybody wants to take, right. the appropriate action then would be potentially mm -hmm. going to the zoning board to appeal. So, so relief for the complainant would be to go through the zoning pro through the zoning board of appeals, appeals right yeah. okay. or court to change or, the, yeah, right. yeah. the no. survey oh right but if it gets to that oh I, I realize that but I mean if, if that the neighbor wanted to yeah fight, that's what that would want. be one yeah. other avenue right. Mm -hmm. right in that manner we would stand by our original decision the applicant original applicant would understand the potential gravity of the situation and maybe they would stop and fix things now or maybe they would roll the dice and go through the zoning mm -hmm. appeals process or, or whatever but that's their choice we've made our decision right. mm -hmm. is, there, is there a way for us to make um kind of like a non-binding recommendation to the the applicant that that they do that rather than saying you know the planning board wants to suspend your building permit until you rectify this issue we say you know we're not doing anything but strongly recommend that you you choose to suspend your you know your work until I mean is like is that does that have any relevance or do we ever like make those kinds of no, non-binding I mean, statements? The strongest the stronger statement would be to issue a statement to the building committee. I mean, if you felt that way that you want the situation resolved now instead of mm -hmm. waiting till the CEO's issue. Right. I'm with Carla. I don't. I, you you don't stop. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, because of. The, I can't see doing that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could see the risk they run if they can't work out the mm -hmm. ability is to decrease the size of the building. But so well, jump jump ahead six months and the building's done, and they're in front of us with an amendment asking for relief, asking for forgiveness, forgiveness instead of asking for permission up front. What position does that put us in? After the fact, after the building's done, do you think collectively we would honestly say tear the building down? You're saying it's difficult yeah, to just stop. Just occupy it. it. Just don't Can't occupy it. it. Yeah. Or it's so why would that come to us if, if, the, bill, if the, well, the commissioner if, was able to What's in front of us now is, is to put it off until, well, I guess you're right. It put, right. It, it'd still it's stay not, with the building. <laughs> right, yeah. Commissioner right. Yeah. Decisions, yeah. And he gives the stick of occupancy. And again, it's not right. in our hands. I mean, they could amend. They could come back and try to amend. Yes. Right. Yep. That's, that's your right. it's their choice. Mm -hmm. right. If they want to be yeah. more conservative, they can file an amendment request for an amendment mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. If they're confident, they'll finish construction. Mm -hmm. Or they'll work with their neighbors. Or, right. Yeah. But in either case, at this stage, right. I think yeah. we're all in agreement that it's not our, mm -hmm. that's, this isn't for us. Mm -hmm. 
Any other? So we're public comment still open. So I think you're just not taking, you're not taking any action. One way or the other. We're saying we've the action, action, we've already taken action. Mm -hmm. And we stand by that original. The October 16th decision. Correct. Mm -hmm. You're saying that if I wish to have enforcement of the original order, I would the zoning board of appeals? If you if you want to appeal a decision made by the by an administrative body, so by the building commissioner, then you appeal that to the zoning board of appeals. Any other comments before we close public first research? Oh, that's not a hearing here. Okay. Oh yeah. So. Okay. So do we need to make a recommendation? Thank you. On. What we just talked about, we've got enough to go by. Okay. It sound like there's anything. Right. No action. Okay. So the last item of action we have, we've got two uh, items of minutes. For November 13th, December 11th. Oh, That's an easy one. Move, a, move approval. You can second. Second by Alan. Uh, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Need one more motion. Move we approve. Adjourn. Second. Bill. All in favor? Aye.